pay. Fan. Decrease. Wait, donos! Expert with $20 and yep with $5. Thank you so much. If this is a business meeting, where's my paycheck? Uh, you're all working pro bono. Thank you for being here. Yep. Chat. I... <sighs> Thran, thank you for the three months. I was supposed to fly him today, but I couldn't. So you're, we're gonna hear this all day today, okay? Theo, thank you. Locke, I should have talked to you before. We should do a plug-in so that it filters that out. Um, conch, conch! 24. 2432 Koopa Steve was $77.77. Thank you so much. Can you do that? Yeah, I think so. Koopa. Thank you, dude. Dr oh my god. Drizzy, you're insane. Drizzy with $500. Josh with 16 months. Mac with $10. Thank you. Drizzy, did you get your item yet? It's been shipped. It's on the way. I don't know if you've received it. But I've seen a lot of them have been delivered. A lot of the auction items. Expert, thank you for the $20. First goal achieved. Holy crap. Um, what's up, guys? This is going to be a pretty low-key... This isn't like a big-time fundraiser, obviously. It's it's pretty low-key, but I figured I'd, I'd do it anyway and, and give you guys some updates. We have a couple calls set up with some folks who are doing work for Alveus. Um, I did not... I'll check, actually. Cool. Uh, Warbird, thank you for the 20 I'm not sure if yours has been delivered. I can't keep track of all of them, but... Um, Whoever, thank you for the $20. Uh, this is going to be pretty low-key. I'm just going to give you guys updates. Um, and, you know, and, and we'll talk about what's up and just, like, hang out. Um, Crowway, thank you for the 10 Appreciate it. Um, low-key fundraiser is a vibe. Nice. Okay. $687 in, like, two minutes. Danza, thank you for the $25. And Alec, thank you for the $5. How are you enjoying the short hair? It's fine. I did notice when I showered yesterday and I, I like, it dried weird when I was laying down and it made a huge difference. That's the first time that like I've had to pay attention to how it dries because up until today, it's just like, it hasn't been long enough to matter. Emma, thank you for the 10. Okay. Chat. <laughs> Let's talk about what the fuck happened in the past 48 hours, shall we? Hang on. Let me find it. <sighs> okay. Okay. So, Ron John, thank you for the 15. First of all, everything is fine, right? Everybody's safe. Everybody's fine now. Do you guys notice anything different? <laughs> Do you notice anything different about my hands? No. Some people actually notice. Okay, I'll give you a f hint. What about now? Jarn, thank you for the two months. I cannot believe. This is exactly what it looks like. I'm chilling in Mrs. Room two nights ago. I take my rings off because they were just like annoying my finger. I just like put them on the ground. I thought she was gonna play with them like baby keys. And Choppy just eats it. Like, it, I, I, I watched her do it and I couldn't believe my mind. I was like, there is, there is no way. Stompy, I'm sorry. I was like, there is no way. She just swallowed that. There's no way. And then I went, she. Yes, the emu. This is the emu. She swallowed my ring. Okay? So... I went and I, I grabbed her and I opened her mouth and I couldn't see it. And then I had her, I was holding her, her neck 
And I, f I was holding the ring. I felt the ring. This whole, the whole thing. I was holding it halfway down her neck. And I was like, am I going to push this back out of, her, or out of her throat? Or do I let it go down? And I didn't want to tear anything. So I dropped it. <laughs> okay. And so it goes. And I could no longer feel it in her neck. Tipsy, thank you for the $250. Okay. So I dropped the ring. She swallowed it, swallowed it. Tipsy, thank you so much. And you got your action item, which is wonderful. Uh, I'm so glad. Um, so, this is 11.30 p.m. I call a couple vets. They're like, we only take dogs and cats. We won't take an emu. So, we went to this, um, this one emergency vet. And it's 11.30. They bring her in at 12.30. There are so many people that have pet emergencies at midnight in the same place. It's actually crazy. So they took her in at like 12.30 p.m. And Matt and I are just sitting in the car. I'm freaking out, like messaging um, Smalls, which is this vet that s submitted her, uh, her resume to p.m. Submitted her resume 12.30 a.m. But yeah, she submitted her resume to Alveus. Um, Casey, thank you for the 25. And I had to turn her down because I was like, we don't, we don't have the resources to have an on-staff vet right now. But I messaged her. I was messaging her constantly, like throughout this whole thing. She was so great about it. But um, we, we're over $1,000. Thank you so much. This is a long story, by the way, just so you know. So like, gear up. Um, so uh, to my team, I see a lot of messages in here. Let me know if I need to know something. Okay, because I, I don't want to read everything right now. Um, so she, uh, they took her in at 1230 in the morning. And then Matt and I are just sitting in the car. I'm freaking out. I have no answers. In my head, I was like, there's no way we can leave it there because it's a foreign object. Maybe there is a way we can leave it there. Maybe that's a thing because emus eat rocks for digestion. I was like, I don't know. Maybe it's okay. I wasn't completely sure if the ring was fully sterling silver. Um, and silver is okay, but if there was any other uh, metal in it, thank you. Um, any other, you know, like nickel or, you know, God forbid it's lead or something, which I knew that it wasn't. I was pretty certain that it wasn't. I was like, there's a toxicity issue. Um, it, you know, there's, there's the chance for obstruction um, or, you know, a blockage that prevents her from being able to go to the bathroom. So I was just, I was freaking out. And I was like, there's no way she can go under and they can cut her open. So I'm freaking out for two hours. And then 2.30 in the morning, they finally call me. We're, all, we're sitting in the car because all vets are curbside right now. Um, you just have to sit in your car. They come get your animal, whatever. And they call me and they're like, hey, uh, just so you know, we don't have any of the equipment to do anything. We could do an x-ray, but if we do an x-ray right now, by the time you get her to someone who could do something, it may have moved anyway. And I was like, okay, so is there a reason that you couldn't tell me that earlier? And the lady gets mad at me on the phone and she's like, there are lots of animals that come through and some of them are just higher priority um, than others, you know, we, we have to do them in order of priority. And I was like, I understand that. I'm not saying, why aren't you getting to my animal first? All I'm saying is telling me that you don't have a scope is something you could have told me over the phone. If you were just going to tell me that all you could do is, is an x-ray and it doesn't matter because you can't do anything about it, you should have told me that over the phone because it's 2.30 in the morning. And she's, she's like pissed. She's like, she thinks I'm one of those pet owners that's just like, my animal's more important. And it's just, it, it was whatever. So we got home at three in the morning, right? I drag my mattress into the, <laughs> I drag my mattress into the rehab room and a blanket. It's 3 a.m. I, I sleep with, with Stompy in the rehab room for the night. She's just like laying there. Cause I was like, you know what? If she's going to die tonight, she's going to die in my arms. I don't like, I was like, I didn't think she was going to die for the record. She was like eating, drinking or no, I wasn't letting her eat, but she was drinking and pooping and she was completely fine. Right. I just wanted to know. I don't know. I, I just like couldn't have slept if I wasn't in there. So I'm in there with her. The other thing I was thinking is once she swallowed the ring, I was like, now that I know she'll do that, what else has there been in the house? Cause she follows me everywhere around the house. What else has there been around the house that she ate that I didn't know that she would eat? You know, like, so I, I sleep with her and then that's at like, I fall asleep at like 3.30 with her. I wake up at 7 a.m. so that I can call all the vets cause all the vets open around about 7 a.m. So I'm calling vets. First also, side note, the vet, the emergency vet that I brought her to, when the tech came to get her from my car in the crate, she said, what species is this, by the way? And I was like, it's an emu. 
And she's like, oh, okay. And took her inside. So then I'm calling vets the next morning. I, I have talked to well over a dozen vets in the past 48 hours. The good news about this whole thing is that I know vets um, in this area now. Um, is that a weird question to ask? For a vet, it was a little bit uh, unsettling. <laughs> for anyone else, no. But for someone that was potentially gonna cut into my animal that night, yes. Or that's what I thought anyway. So then, I'm calling vets. One of the vets that I called was like, I said, I have this 17 day old emu. Um, she swallowed a ring. I, I, I need to know what to do. Um, do you know every kind of animal? Is that, is that weird for me to be concerned about that? I also called and told them what it was. Okay, whatever. So one of the vets that I talked to, I said, I have, I have an emu, a 17 year old emu. And she was like, this might be a weird question, but what kind of animal is that? Is that a bird? And I was like, yeah, it's a bird. And she was like, okay, um, we don't take birds. And I was like, okay, thank God. So I'm calling other vets. I finally found a vet that would take, I meant 17 day, yeah, that'll take an emu. So I bring her to the vet. They do x-rays. I was terrified the whole time that they were gonna find something else in her but this is the x-ray. So all that was in there is the ring, <laughs> right? And the other concerning thing about this vet was she told me, the doctor, like the, the vet was like, you know, this ring is in here, but I'm hoping that it's still in her crop and I can just take it out with hemostats. And I was like, okay, well that's gonna be a problem because ratites don't have crops. So you're not gonna be able to take it out because she works with parrots and parrots have a crop, right? It's like, so do birds of prey. It goes into the crop first and then, and then proventriculus, whatever, right? That's like how it works. But ratites don't have crops. Emus don't have crops. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like, you're not gonna be able to take it out of her crop because she doesn't have a crop. So then they did this x-ray. They showed me the x-ray. Everybody at the center was obsessed with her or everybody at the vet was obsessed with her. They loved her. They all took selfies with her. Great, like, whatever. And then they told me after they took the x-ray, they were like, yeah, so we did this x-ray, but unfortunately we don't have any of the equipment to do anything here. But we did take this x-ray. So the only, the, the place that I can recommend that has what the equipment that you need to take this out is three hours north. <laughs> so they give me my emu back and I drive directly from that vet office three hours north to another vet office. That's an avian and exotics vet office. So I get there, they take, the, they take her in, and I got there at like 2 p.m. yesterday. And they had other animals, thank you for the three gifted, um, they had other animals to take care of all day. So at the end of the day, they stayed after hours to do this because they were worried and we didn't know what kind of metal it actually was. I bought this ring from Etsy in March of 2019 and I messaged the seller on Etsy and I said, hey, I know this is so weird, but my emu swallowed your ring from three years ago and I need to know what it's made out of. Because on her website, on the Etsy thing, it's very like wishy-washy. It's like, yeah, you're like plated in sterling silver. And I was like, look, is it a cheap metal and it's covered in sterling silver? I don't care. I bought it. I've been wearing it. I love it, right? Just tell me, please, what is in it? And she finally responded today, and she's like, wow, this is the weirdest customer care request I've ever gotten, but it's 100% sterling silver. And I was like, well, they already got it out, but thank you. Um, and I sent her the x-rays and, like, photos and whatever. Uh, but that was the main thing we were concerned about, is the toxicity, because I didn't know what else was in it. So, spoiler, don't you guys want to know that? I said she was okay. Hesitant, thank you for the seven months. So, after hours yesterday, the vet stayed and tried to get it out endoscopically, which, which is this. An endoscope is like this little, little camera thing, you know? A little camera and you put it, put it down the throat and, uh, 
pull it out, right? So they tried to do it endoscopically last night. And the vet was so frustrated because there was food in the way. So he couldn't see it. After they had knocked her out, he was like, there was food, which was so frustrating because the vet that did the x-ray, there was still crumble in her crate. And I asked the vet, I was like, should I dump this crate out so that she doesn't eat? Should I be fasting her? Or do you think it's not gonna matter? And the vet was like, it's not gonna matter. I wouldn't fast a bird, especially this size. I think you should let her eat. And I was like, okay, thank you. So there was food in the way. So they couldn't see the ring with the endoscope. So I was like, all right, I'm three hours north. It's dark outside. I'm just gonna sleep in my car outside the vet office and they'll try again in the morning and that's fine. And I told the vet that and they freaked out and they were like, please don't sleep outside. Please don't sleep in your car. Like, we feel so bad. Please don't sleep in your car. And I was like, okay, I'll get a hotel. <laughs> so, sorry. So I got a hotel um, and stayed in a hotel last night. And then this morning they tried again and they got it on the third try with an endoscope. Graham, thank you for the five. Guilted you into getting a hotel? Not, I mean, no, they weren't like, you need to get a hotel. Like they, they would have let me sleep in the car, but I didn't, I, I don't know. I, it was better that I slept at a hotel anyway. How much did you pay for all that? You can guess if you'd like. Um, 3,000, 8,000, 10,000, 5,000. This is crazy. The first x-ray, $250. Fine, right? A lot less than I thought. Then the second, yesterday at the vet, $859 for them to try the endoscope the first time and to knock her out. And then this morning, all they charged me for her staying overnight and redoing the entire procedure was $120. They fudged the shit out of those numbers. <laughs> Monkaroo, thank you for the 300. Um, they fudged the shit out of those numbers. They did not charge me an overnight stay. Because if you've ever had your animal, Monkaroo, thank you so much. If you've ever had your animal stay overnight at a vet, you know it's way more than $120. Um, Sassy, thank you for the three months. They just, like, loved her. The hotel costed just under $200, like, with tax. So, it was fine. Um, I just, like, laid in bed, half crying, half freaking out, watching uh, Beat Bobby Flay for, like, five hours. And commercials. I have not watched commercials in forever. It's crazy that they only play, like not even 10 minutes of a show, and then it's the same amount of time of commercials. I can't believe that I used to watch TV like that. What a fucking horrible system. Anyway, um... Yeah, so that's the story. Pretty much. Uh, what else am I missing from that story? Oh, when I was trying to do research on... The ring is... Do you want to see it? It's in my car. I can grab it. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> okay, I'll go get it. <clears throat> you can hang out with Orion.
Here it is. <laughs> Wear it. <laughs> okay, now eat it. You know what's crazy? Is it looks the same. Like, it looks the exact same as before she swallowed it. Look. Please. Why wouldn't it? I don't know. I just, like, it's just if I saw it, I wouldn't know that it's been in an emu's stomach, you know? They sanitized it before they gave it to me. What? This doesn't have fucking emu, like, gastrointestinal fluid on it. Crazy. Psycho? I, it feels, it feels wrong just to put it back on. I don't know. Like, I feel like I shouldn't wear it now. <laughs> Why? I don't know. It's just like, this has caused me so much stress in the past 48 hours. I kind of hate it. It's cursed. Like, I don't know. It's a good story. It's a damn good story. But, holy fuck, it was horrible. Bulky, thank you for the 11 months. Um, auction it off? No. <laughs> That's a banger auction item. No. Um, I already ordered those, like, uh, paw print impression kits. Um, so I can do two stompy prints and one ring print for the vets. <laughs> the vets were so great. They were so nice and they were super, besides the first vet, they were so nice and so uh, communicative and, and they really did care. They tried so hard, especially the second vet that's so far away. Um, unfortunately, is the only vet that'll do anything like that can actually do anything for exotics. So that'll probably be Alvaeus's vet. Um, the guy, the, the guy who did the procedure, he, he called me after he did it. He was like so giddy. Um, and he was like, by the way, I heard you raised a bunch of money to, uh, start up that animal sanctuary that you start up an animal sanctuary. And I was like, how, do, how did you hear that? <laughs> like, what do you mean? Um, and he was like, oh, I hope it's not creepy. I just like, I saw, I had to tell them where I got the emu, which by the way, is a fantastic system that I've never thought about. They have a sheet on your like intake, your new client registration form, where you have to say where you purchased your pet from or where you got your pet from. Um, which is a great way to know if you get a bunch of animals with like, you know, birth defects or like whatever, um, that you know where they came from. But anyway, I, I've never had a vet ask me that and I thought that was really cool. So I told them I got it from, um, the zoo. And so he saw it and he was like, well, that's not typical. Um, like that's not a breeder. So he looked up my name and when you Google search my name now, look at this this nice so yeah that's that's how he found out and he was like yeah it sounds like a great nonprofit. if you guys ever need anything let us know and I was like nice I will let you know uh but yeah so there was that as well and he said he doesn't really follow Twitch. I didn't ask him. I should have. He was like, he doesn't really follow Twitch, but he follows uh, some gamers and some speedrunners. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Did the vet call you Bald Higa? No, but this is Stompy Higa. Which I thought was funny. I mean, I know that's how it works with vets. I just think it's funny. He's watching Clint, perhaps. Anyway, yeah, I don't know what to do with this ring now. I feel like I should put my rings on, I don't know, like a necklace or something. I don't want to just wear it anymore, frame it. I don't know. I'll do something with it, but I don't even want to wear it right now. It feels, I don't, I don't want to. Feels not right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's been the past 48 hours. Oh, that's what I was going to say before I left. And I did some research about whether or not she was going to die. There was an emu in the UK who, uh, <clears throat> I'll show you, who still had his stripes. So, like, baby. And, 
His name is Eddie the Emu. He he ate a pair of diamond earrings that were really expensive, obviously. Um, was. I think he's still alive. But this big, so like the same size. And he ate this pair of diamond earrings. And when they did the x-rays, he had also eaten like two screws. And they weren't able to get them out for whatever reason, so uh, they just left him in there and he's fine. I don't, like, he's fine? I don't know. And then, um, Max, thank you, it was 16 months. And then Smalls, the vet, she messaged her vet friend who said that, uh, oh, the earrings got, they were insured. And so they got, the woman got new ones. So she's hoping that her bird will pass them one day, and then she'll have two pair. <laughs> Mom, thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, this, this other vet said, From a six-month-old emu, surgically, I removed six screws. One was a 1.5-inch wood screw, 15 pennies, one dime, one nickel, and a variety of other junk that was metallic, ceramic, or plastic from a six month old emu. So I called my contractor today. This bird is living in a bubble for the rest of her life, by the way. Um, I called my contractor today and I was like, hey, I just wanna make absolute certain that you guys are super careful when you're building the pasture fence uh, and that the whole area, I will, I'll pay you guys extra to, to sweep the whole area with a metal detector. And we talked about it, and I talked about what happened with the emu, and he's like, you know what, we'll use no nails. Um, they're just going to use bolts and brackets. Um, so there will be no nails in the pasture, but I'm still going to buy a metal detector, and I'm going to sweep the pasture anyway. <laughs> Myself. <laughs> so, yeah, and I just have to be really careful with her in the house. I really just, like, had no idea that she would eat it. That she would eat anything like that. Metal detector stream? I will. I'll stream it. I'll stream around the whole property. We'll, like, walk around or something. <sighs> what did she eat? Guess. Why get a metal detector? Just put an emu in there. Right. Nice. Good. Thank you. She's fine now. She's been fine the whole time. The whole time. She's been eating and drinking and pooping and running around and zooming everywhere. She's fine. <laughs> she, she has no idea what happened. She just met a bunch of people at the vet and she loved them and they loved her. And she was like vibing the whole time. Sir, thank you for the hundred dollars. Maya was the only one impacted. She literally had no idea that anything bad was happening. She was just fucking chilling and she still is. Um, I cannot, yes, yeah, she's gonna be completely fine. She's on Meloxicam for like a week. MZ, thank you for the 14 months. They all eat random shit like goats. Yeah, emus eat rocks to aid in digestion, but She's tiny, and that ring is a size five, which I know is kind of small for a ring, but for her is big. Did they confirm her gender? No, they did not. <sighs> Silver might clear the bowels. Well, maybe they did. I don't know. I'm new here. Does the bird like to look at the wall or is he in trouble? He's not. It's not like a punishment. I'm not like, Ori, look at the wall, you bad bird. He's just, it's just the way that falcons sit because they poop straight down. I don't know if I've explained this to you guys. Red tails poop projectile. Falcons poop straight down. It's, thank you. Um, so the way that that perch is set up, he'll stand on the edge of it always and will poop off the, pop off the side of it. 
so that it doesn't get on the perch itself. Does that make sense? Like, he doesn't- he wouldn't just walk around on a flat space and, like, poop everywhere and then have to walk over it. That's why the perch is the way that it is. That's why he faces the wall. No shot, that room doesn't reek. It doesn't reek, but I- I have to clean the paper every day. Bird poop is not- is nothing like mammal poop. I will tell you that for certain. The stuff on the carpet is tiny little feathers from when I feed him quail and he plucks them off and they fall down. It's not poop. It's like feathers that big. I just have to vacuum. Um, ahoy. Does he molt? Yeah, he'll start molting in a couple weeks, probably. Any other updates? Plenty. Um, but I think that's, that's the, that's the stompy story. She's fine. But it was a long couple days, for sure. Um, I, uh, you didn't even clickbait the story? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I've had a long couple days. I'm, like, super tired. I'm really excited to sleep. Uh, tonight. That's also the first time I've ever stayed at a hotel by myself. It was really strange. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't- <laughs> I don't even remember. What? Oh, that's a no. Mod said no. I actually don't remember, I'm gonna be completely honest. Um... Anyway, so we have a couple things planned for today. Um, the, it's just a timeout. Oh, okay. The first, we're, we have a couple calls set up with some folks who are doing things for Alveus. Yes, Gruber. I am. Um, uh oh. I'm, uh, no, not, not bad. Uh, oh, it's just, a uh, Corridor is coming on Wednesday to film, and we're trying to figure out how to get this, uh, camera situated on, on our birds, uh, without it being dangerous, because the first model they had, like, picture Ori's back is like this, and his backpack is right here. It was a camera that stuck out, like, like, two or three inches like this, um, and if you picture him, his head's down here and his tail's here, stooping like this with with something that's standing up uh it, it it just won't work it's really dangerous because it'll pull like on his back and and um so that's not gonna work uh so then they turn the camera sideways and i thought that that was fine but my sponsor is saying that it still isn't so i don't know it's stressing me out <laughs> we don't have a bigger bird I, they said that it would be fine on a red tail but not for a stooping falcon because both of our birds now are stooping over 50 feet or over 50 miles an hour um, Asteroid with the 200. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my god. That number went up so fast when I was $1,642.16. Thank you. We have covered Stompy's vet bills. <laughs> what does stooping mean? It means, you know, climbing up and then... Uh, we also wanted to try to do it midday so that, uh they can potentially catch thermals. I've never seen Ori, or Ori has never caught a thermal before that I know of. A thermal is like a hot air current that goes up like this. Um, so think like twister and birds can, can catch onto that and then it helps them climb to higher altitudes without using too much energy. Um, so if they can catch a thermal and then stoop, it, it makes for a way faster, uh, way higher stoop, which is kind of cool. So we're, we're hoping to do it midday. I'm gonna fly Ori tomorrow, I'll stream it. Um, tomorrow midday so that we can start uh, adjusting to that to that time frame. I think I'll stream it. What day is it? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I just won't go to the center tomorrow because I, I should fly him. Anyway, um, do they just do it for fun? No, for food. <sighs> so I have a couple calls set up today. One of the calls being with uh, Mojo, who is making our chinchilla enclosure for Alveus. One call with Acom, so we can talk about the wooden signs. Um, I'm hoping to be able to call Ella, except she's in a class from 6 to, like, 9. So, if we're still live, I'll talk to Ella. Otherwise, I'll just talk about what I was going to talk with her about. And I messaged William Sorley, potentially, about talking to him, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Will I still be live at 9 o'clock? Or should I just talk about all that stuff now? Um, oh yeah, also Dan. Wait, is Dan here? Dan's here. Uh, no. I saw him in Mrs. chat. I don't know if he's here. Dan. ding ling, -ling. Yo. Um, is it cool if I show them what you sent me so far? ding ling 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 ding ling ling Cool. Alright, um, so we'll do first order of business here. Chat, welcome to the business meeting. It's it's officially uh, in order. Can I get a motion to adjourn the Stompy Hell story? I got a motion. Can I can somebody second that motion? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Great. Um so Stompy portion adjourned. The first order of business is we, I am waiting on an estimate for building the parrot aviary. The parrot aviary will house Mia, Siren, Tico, and Riley. Miley, Crash, thank you for the hundred dollars. Mia is an African gray. They don't know if it's male or female. She named herself after a child that she lived with named Mia. Beta, thank you. Siren is a blue-fronted Amazon. Not that siren, it's just S-I-R-E-N. Um, Tico is a blue and gold macaw. And Miley is a Catalina macaw. So they're all parrots. Two macaws, one African K, one blue-fronted Amazon. Hi, Ashley. Um, so they're all going to live in this big aviary. And I've asked Dan to create um, to create the 3D, a 3D model, I guess. I don't know what the right word is, but uh, of, of the aviary. One for my contractor, two for you guys, and three for potential, a render. A 3D render of the aviary and three for potential sponsors. So I will show you what he has so far. Do, 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 do. Ba, ba, da, ba, 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 ba. It's so cool. Okay, here's one picture. I did not realize, it's 20 by 20 by 15 feet high. Um, and the ideal is uh, stainless steel wire on the sides and plexiglass panels um, on these sides. And this is a vestibule, vestibule, uh, so you know, if you go into an aviary, it's like one. The, the person is six feet tall. Just for reference. Thank you. Um, yeah, like an airlock. Uh-huh. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, that's why I put these people in. But this is... I can't believe how tall 15 feet is. It's like crazy. Um, so that's one of the one of the renders. This is it from the front. Wow. Wow. Cool. And then this is it. Again. Wow. Sunset. Pretty. Okay. And this is it from the inside. So again, this is like with ideal material. Um, 
there's a very good chance that when I get the estimate, stainless steel mesh is expensive. And so is plexiglass. Uh, so there's a chance that it's not these materials, but I, I don't want to skimp on the size of it. Um, I, I do want it to be at least 20 by 20 by 15 feet high. So we'll see, but I'm, I'm waiting on estimates for that. Do, 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 do. And then, yeah, half of, or part of the top will have, will be covered probably with like corrugated metal. The plexiglass would be the highest cost. Actually, no, stainless steel is more expensive than plexiglass panels. Which surprised me, also. But, um, macaws can chew through a lot, so. Bottle bricks? What is a bottle brick? What is that? You can do Command LVS if you want to follow the socials. Bricks made from recycled bottles. Oh, wait, that's cool. Um. Uh, I don't know if this is what I'm looking for. Bricks made from recycled plastic. That's cool. But I don't want bottles around. I know that for sure. I know that in this house. Um, so that's that's the update from Dan. Hearts and chat for Dan. Good stuff. Um, so we'll be using that to... Uh, to get sponsors for, for that aviary um, and for my contractor to have a really good idea of what's going on. Will there be trees inside? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll probably plant live things in there. And then we're getting donated um, all of the, as much as we can take of this manzanita um, that exists already in Tico and Miley's enclosure. So this whole like crazy structure of perches um, she's gonna donate all of it. It's all manzanita, so, um, they'll be able to, like, have this, like, crazy perch canopy climbing gym. <laughs> Always. This is, except for some reason, you know, they still, they sit on the metal perch together. But, you know, uh, still cool to have, so, yeah. So we'll do that, and then we'll do lots of live plants and stuff in it as well. You should try to make a TikTok. Yeah, we actually have a TikTok. Um, it should be in the Command Alveus thing. I don't think we've posted yet, but uh, Max and Eldrix have created TikToks already. Have they? No, they haven't posted yet, but they've made some and we'll, we'll put stuff on there. So, yeah. So that's the first order of business, working on stuff. Nice. The second order of business, let me... Actually, Acom, you want to talk now? Because I know you're here. I don't know. I'll, I'll message Mojo later. I I don't have anything, like, prepared to talk to you, honestly. But we'll figure it out as we go. Okay, cool. I'll call you. Um, yo. Yo. Okay. So, I pressured ACOM live the other day and asked him if he would wood burn signs for Alveus. I will pay you for it um, if you'd like to be paid for it. But you made all the little... You guys You guys know who ACOM is. I don't need to introduce... Do you want to introduce yourself? No. Okay, cool. I make things out of wood. That's it. Sick. Um, so ACOM streams some wood burning stuff. What is the? What's the largest thing that you've ever burned? Probably the sign I made for during the charity stream. How big was it? The Alvea sign. Wait. How big can was you it? Give it to me? It's already sent. What? It actually should be there already at the FPO box. 
Oh, no, I mean, like, do you have a picture? Oh, like, the, the picture of it. Yeah. Uh, hold on, let me find it. I think it's in here. How, do I, how much do I have to donate to get her to smoke a cigarette and speak French? Okay. <laughs> so... Acom is gonna wood burn. Name a price? No, I don't think that's. Seems like it's not allowed. Um, I. <laughs> Acom's gonna make two signs potentially for Alveus because there are three buildings at Alveus, and one is the animal care coordinator house, so Ella will live there. The second one is a nutrition house, so we'll keep all of the. Uh, We'll do all the diet prep in there and store a bunch of food in there. The two chinchillas will live in there. And then there will be an indoor parrot enclosure um, for Mia and Siren. So the African Grey and the Blue Fronted Amazon. And then Ella will have to put her rabbit in there at night because she'll have her outside during the day. But then at night, because Ella's now taking Bella and Maverick, not just Maverick, um, because my mom's dog hates Bella. So she'll take both of them. Um, Bella would harass her rabbit at night. You found it. Wait, is this you? Yep. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, that's so fucking sick. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Acom did this and he's done lots of wood burning that he sent us as well. This is so cool. Um, so this is perfect. Okay. I was going to look up a bunch of like reference pictures of what it should look like, but one, I want to say nutrition house. And mm -hmm. the second, I need your help on, and also chat's help, potentially. It's like, so it's two rooms. The building is two rooms. One is a reptile and arthropod and arachnid room. And then the other room is the media studio. So where all the streaming will happen. And obviously that's not all gonna go on a sign. But it could just say, like, media studio. That's that's what I was thinking. But chat, if you have a better scary room, no. Scary room. That's terrible. <laughs> Not room of horrors. No, the point, it could just say studio. That's also true. Yeah. Studio. It has spiders. That shit's scary. No, it's not. Media or studio. Just chatting. <laughs> Just. They call them tech room. I would not want to go in room. there if it was called tech room. What do you think, Acon? 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 <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> See, I'm used to acorn. Acorn! All right. Yeah. That's fun. I like that. Uh, I think studio is good. Okay. Do you think that there should be, should it just be text? Twitch logo? I could logo? put a picture. Mm. Chat, should there be a picture? Put a camera next to my With a What camera. I could do is... <laughs> <T -tours. laughs> I could, um... Burn on a separate piece with my laser, like a detailed picture, and attach it next to the text that I hand do. I can't burn a large piece in the laser, mm -hmm. but or I could hand draw a picture. Just it can't be super detailed. Would T tours be stupid? It is kind of stupid, but like cringy, cringy stupid. People are saying no. Do you think that's cringy? I don't. <laughs> Just the I think just the camera part. part. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, maybe wait, could you do that by burning, or would yeah. you use the? I can do that by hand. Okay, um, and then for the nutrition house, chat. Okay, wait. I'm gonna say, studio nutrition house. Okay. Do a peepo fan. <laughs> 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 that would actually be really cute. I actually like that. Okay. Let's I do it. I can do that. <laughs> All right. Okay, sick. Um, and then... Damn, he was being ironic. I like it. I think it's cute. Tavian's so again... No, that was a joke. I don't think it's... I think it's I think fine. it's good. I like it. 
Um, okay, and then in terms of size, what is a standard door? Because the doors are standard. Standard... 80 inches by 36 inches. Okay. <laughs> Why did you look that up? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so it'll be, it'll be right above a standard door. So, um, the size for that, 80 by, so like 30, 30 inches across. Uh, let me see the biggest. So, I, okay. Do you want something with like the live edge, like the, like the bark on the side, like a scent of the picture there? I think so. Chat, this, right. this edge, right? I think that looks really nice. Yeah. Yeah. The bark. Okay. All right. Let me check what I can get here lengthwise uh, all right i can get 23 inches across which is okay pretty it'll sit nicely in the middle of the door with six inches on each side just Sick. about that'd be dope he's contacting his wood dealer <laughs> my wood dealer no uh, known as the hardware store Oh, nice. Yeah. Just, yep. Okay. It'll be nicer than Big Dog's bench, though. Yes. Thank you. I'm so appreciate it. Um. So <laughs> we'll do. Uh, we'll do these two. That's awesome. Um. And then. I don't know if you want to seal it or I can seal it because it'll be outside. I don't know what. I can. I can polyurethane it. It's fine. Oh. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um. What is that? Okay, so what's your plan? You're gonna stream the whole process? Yeah, I'll stream making it. Yay! Tell me, do you have a stream schedule or do you just go live whenever? I just go live whenever okay. at the moment. All right, well, I'll, uh, I'll just put you on the auto host until it's uh, done. And then if you're ever live when I'm live, I'll host you. All right, cool. Sick. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so excited. All right, no problem. All right, later. Yeah, see ya. Big time. Big time. Da -da -da -da. That's actually so cool. This is so nice. I gotta figure out where to put this. I love this. Wee. Okay, um... The only thing is we'll just have to make sure that it's like bold enough that it can be read from, you know, a distance. I'm in art college and love a non-paid opportunity. If uh, you're welcome to send a resume to uh, Maya at AlveaSanctuary.org, but you'll probably just go on a list of, um, won't be an issue, dope. You'll probably just go on a list of people that uh, I don't need help from right now, but I may uh, in the in the future list buddies okay. um okay so there's the call with acom very cool nice i'm excited um i also had a photographer mail me some prints uh, that are at the p.o box i just have to pick them up but he's a wildlife photographer and so he sent some prints that we can put up at alveas as well i'm really excited for that um that was quick, yeah. Oh, also, somebody asked, sorry, this was three minutes ago, but said, have you considered a for a li live events like a Twitch channel or Alveus with a 24-7 cam for a week in particular, and in a particular enclosure? Uh, yeah, so one of the things that I was thinking, and this is like totally in the works and not, absolutely not decided, and this is a good time to talk about it, is I've recently had a call with a company that is creating um, this live camera that's AI for detecting or IDing bird species. Like it's one of those cameras where if a bird shows up in it, it like puts a box around the bird and it says like 62% certainty this is a Carolina wren, you know, or, or whatever. Um, and they're working on making a model that's like, that they can sell to the general public. And they want me to be part of their pilot program. Um, and so I've talked to them a whole bunch and I, and I told them I, I would if it doesn't, I, I'm worried about bandwidth. Um, and I don't know if there's, if it is a good idea for me to run a live stream um, at that facility based on how much upload speed I have. If that's a possibility and it's not gonna be a problem, I'll consider it. And, and I think it'd be kind of cool to run a 24 seven live cam in the pollinator garden um, of, you know, just like birds and whatever, but Starlink, yeah. Um, I'm supposed to 
Connor has told me that I'm supposed to, you know, that I should purchase that. Or not purchase, pre-purchase? I don't even know how it works. Just sign up for it, yeah. I got linked. Recycled art ideas. Building with eco bricks. Glass bottle walls. Oh my gosh. Ooh, it's like mosaics. Pretty. Well, I don't know that this is very pretty, but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the inside is pretty. Um, and then eco bricks. A salad. Yeah, yeah, we can do like fun arts and crafts and stuff as like content and just whatever, but um, I heard that you want a zebra. Uh, no, I, I have not. I, I would like to get a zebra, but I, I'm not sure how to acquire one. I'm not quite there yet. Um, okay, so that's the idea for the bird thing. Also, I have a shipment on its way uh, from this. Actually, at this point, I think I can tell you what the company is. This is our first, this is Alvea's first like partnership, but it's not a paid partnership. It's not a sponsor. Um, and the only reason that I'm accepting it and promoting it is because I do like what they're doing. Um, they do, uh, they're, they're UK based, but they do, uh, um, wildlife housing, um, that people can buy. So like, I don't, oh, that's food. Look, they do really cute bat boxes. Um, and cute bee boxes. Wow. And, uh, these are really cute too. Little toad houses. Oh. And bird houses, hedgehog houses. We don't need these in the US, but in the UK, in the UK you might. Anyway, um, so they've sent, uh, they, I don't know, I don't know how many products, but they've sent a bunch of products to my house um, so that we can just put them at Alveus. Um, and if this partnership doesn't doesn't progress into something bigger, that's completely fine. I'm just excited to have wildlife houses and you know bird houses in particular. Um, so we'll be able to put up really nice ones because they are all like really high quality uh, houses products, like and they're really just really cute and and built really nice and. Um, yeah, so that's cool, and, and they're sending those for free from their U.S. office, which is neat, um, and I talked to them about the potential of, yeah, Melena, I know that she made one of those, um, I talked to them about the potential of doing a special line of birdhouses that has the logo laser engraved, um, and then potentially doing, like, an affiliate code type thing. Um, Saint, thank you for the 10. I appreciate it. Um, so I think I talked about this briefly, but potentially like doing doing a line of Alveus products on their website um, where a portion of the proceeds go to Alveus. Um, I'd be down for that, but again, it's a slow moving thing. It's hard because they're based in the UK. So yeah, but still exciting that we're getting a bunch of cool little houses to put up at Alveus. So uh, small steps, but I'm excited about that. Um, I also talked to, um, a, <laughs> an esports organization, a mobile esports organization, um, who are interested in, in partnering in some way, um, and I am going to talk to them, I have another call with them, um, this weekend no, next week, uh, to talk about potentially sponsoring a garden, our pollinator garden, um, so they can have their name on the garden. But what is mobile esports? Like, mobile COD, I think, is the primary? I don't know. Um, I don't watch mobile COD, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're willing to make... Uh, a generous donation. So um, I'm very excited to be talking to them um, and they want to get involved and they want their creators to be involved. Uh, and 
I would love for them to be able to sponsor the pollinator garden. So pollinator garden is something, it's seven o'clock now. I'm gonna message Mojo and see if he's ready to talk about the chinchilla enclosure. And maybe we'll get to the point where we can talk to Ella. If not, I'll just talk to you guys about it. It's not like an esports. It's it's not like it's gonna be Alvaeus esports. It's just they want to they want to do a collaboration. That's that's it. It's it's nothing bigger than that. Like they they want to contribute. <laughs> um. Okay, so this guy, um, this guy reached out to me and he was like, I do woodworking. I'm trying to do woodworking full time. It's my dream to woodwork. He dug a fucking trench out to his shop so that he could stream there because he just wants to stream woodworking. And he offered to do any, like a project that we wanted for free. Um, and he's like the nicest person. He needed mods for his channel. Um, and so I asked, I asked some of my mods if they'd be down and I gave him some names and each of the people that, that, uh, that said yes, he messaged them and he's like, thank you so much. And he sent them all $50 <laughs> before he's even streamed. He was like, thank you so much for helping me mod. <laughs> he's so nice. Okay. Um, all right. I'm calling him. His name is Mojo. I mean, it's not his name, but you know. Yo. Yo. Why the fuck are you exposing me already? <laughs> Dude, it's so nice. You're so nice. I want chat to think that I'm cool. Bad boy persona. You just ruined it. This I didn't is, even get started. This is the bad boy, folks. So he's <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. Um, all right, so let's talk chinchilla gang. We have a group chat with me, him, and Ella. <laughs> um, and You're gonna hear a lot of that. Um, ding dong, ding dong. Okay, how is your internet situation at the shop? It is the so fiber is in the shop. Dang. Um, I'm just waiting on them to come out and set up the modem. Nice. So next week maybe. I don't know. Wow. Sick. Soon. Soon. Okay. Yes. Let's let me just pull up. I'll pull up the pictures that that you've sent. And we'll mm -hmm. just like go through them. I don't know if I need to, do I need to fix? Oh, no, nope, he figured it out. These pictures are of, tell me about your nose flute thing. What, what is this? Him and Ella huh? were talking, you and Ella were talking about a nose flute. Oh, well that, I mean, I don't know. We were just, we were just talking. I was just, you know, <laughs> okay. getting to know Ella. Okay. She's cool. Um, I'm gonna make her a nose flute so that she can learn how to play it. Hey Maya, I know you're not hiring, but I just started working on your website. I no, you're not. No, you did. I have a website. Um, but thank you for. If you want to send me a resume, you can. Um, but I already have a team that's working on the website. Um, okay. Uh, the first thing. Okay, so should I call you Mojo? Is that what you want to be called? Yeah, okay. that works. So, and your Twitch channel is what? Uh, Mojo makes it. Nice. I'll type in chat. Let's go. M -O Any gifters? Any gifters? Come on, guys. Okay, Pick me all up. right. Here we go. This was a mistake. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mojo, um, we were talking about the chinchilla enclosure, and, and Ella and I were like, we want it to be kind of large. We know we want it to be in the nut house, and we know that we want to have, we want it to be like fun for them and interactive for them, and we want enrichment items in there. Um, and I've showed you guys some of this so far, but the first thing Ella and I were like, can we make something that's easy to clean? and that uh, where we can have perches that can be changed out, like platforms, because chinchillas like to climb and like run around and whatever, but it's good enrichment to change around perching and change around their environment. So we were like, let's do, uh, it's a whole story. We were like, let's use pegboard. Um, yes, go ahead and make your child jokes. Anyway, so like this thing, and we were like, can we do perches in here? And then Mojo didn't like that idea because Pegboard sucks. Right. So then um, he came up with this idea, which is a, you could explain it. So a French cleat system is essentially, it's like two 45 degree angles and they mate together. So you put the, uh, the female cleat on the wall and then the male cleat on whatever you want to put on the wall and then you can move it around and uh, yeah, it'll be cool, I think. 
Uh, they'll be able to move it around so the chinchillas don't get bored. Sick. So. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. the first thing that we came up with. Um, then I think, I think you sent the wheel after that. Oh, 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 this this whole shape. Okay. Um, so you're building this in four sections. How are you doing this? Uh, you should actually go look at the latest 3D model, the one that True. I. Okay. Um, you linked there. this. It to you again. Here, let's look at this link. And you can put that in chat. It's it's a public link, so they should be able to look at it and like move around and all that. Man, what is this? Oh, what what, the, what are you doing? Your this, link, has nothing, man. this has nothing to do with chinchilla. <laughs> this is me and Ella and we're talking about nose flutes. Cause she she played the flute in in band in high school. <laughs> and then you and then he was like, "I'm gonna make you one." <laughs> yeah, I have a friend that plays the nose flute, and he's like, "I'm telling you, like, it's it's hot, like it's cool." <laughs> <laughs> Ella's um, Ella's username is Geology Rocks, and when she turned when she refused him making her a nose flute, he said. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> Leaking DMs. What the okay, hell? All right, I, I'm I'm opening the link right now. <laughs> okay. Um, this is. Wait, it's not loading. Oh, it's loading. Yep. Yep. This is so sick. Okay, I don't know why Miz is on it though. I wanted something that like people knew the scale of. <laughs> He's a little thinner, I think, but. <laughs> Here, chat. I'll link this to you so you can see. Is it gonna like crash if I link it to them? Should I? Just... Nah, no. Okay. I don't <laughs> that's trust that's anything. owned by Autodesk. I think they're good. Okay. They're a giant company. Um. So. Oh, you never know. This is what it's gonna look like. Amazing. Hello. Wow. Wait. So, are you building this in? Oh my God. Are you building this in old Miz? So I was. Scale? I was gonna do it in four sections, but. I, th I was thinking that might be a little tricky to get it to all line up and look right. Mm -hmm. Whatever, it's all sitting down <clears throat> and in place in the building. So I'm going to do it in two, top and bottom. Okay. It, it'll be just as easy to get in there. I mean, it'll be like moving any other big piece of furniture, so like a dresser. Oh, <laughs> okay, and what's the, what are the dimensions? Uh, it's two foot deep, uh, seven foot tall, and five foot wide. Let's go. So, That's yeah. sick. It'll That's a good. great size. Ella. I'll be sure to put the uh, the like latches and stuff down low so you can reach them. I won't put all them at the top. All right. So the next thing that he was talking about, where's the uh, where's the little fucking wheel that you linked? Was that at the beginning? Uh, I might have missed it. Yeah, it was pretty. I think that was the first oh, thing I said. Oh my god. Yeah. Here it is. Okay. So this open. This, but uh, coggers. Unless you guys would like a different emote, because this is what Mojo put on. <laughs> yeah, I'm still not 100% sure if this is even going to work, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I have no idea. Like, how do you make a wheel? So, like, I have, like, I have like bearings modeled in there and other stuff, but uh, I'm I'm not really worried about that part. I'm more worried about making the actual circle right. around the outside. Yeah, but that's what I was. I could I could bend like metal and do it. There's there's a million ways to do it, so I'll come up with something. We'll we'll have a wheel for sure. Sick. So there's their one enrichment item, and then they'll have a. Uh... The shelves that we can move uh, for another enrichment item. Can we talk about the shelves for a minute? Please. So, uh, has Ella ever been on stream? Ye well, yeah, so she she came with me for the stream that we did uh, for Race to World First with Asmin. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, no, she actually, she did do a lot of the talking there. Yeah, but she hasn't okay. really been on my I stream. I guess I just, I guess I missed it then. Because um, I've never seen Ella. But anyway, chat, if you don't know Ella... Dank is an understatement, okay? What? She is like, she likes rocks. Like you have to be really fucking dank to like rocks. And she her wants and Maya, to look like naturalistic. They, they want it to look natural, but like okay, like I don't know if you guys have ever held a rock, 
they're really fucking heavy and they're really hard <laughs> oh, to do I anything know what you're with. About now. So they want the shelves and like the this, little house that they that. live in. I did not recommend this, but I know I know. You said it first. About. I but, said uh, I, I knew you. Yeah, but Ella is the one that wants rocks. Like, she said rock shelves. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm I'm. I, I go to a rock store yesterday just to look, peruse their their rocks they have for sale to see if they have anything that'll work. Now, they had mostly small gravel and stuff that you like put, would put in flower beds, and then they had giant boulders. Some of them like over a thousand pounds, like moss growing on them, like straight out of SpongeBob. Like pioneers ride these babies for miles, like that kind of shit. Yeah. So I'm like, how the fuck am I supposed to take this big ass boulder and make it into a shelf? You don't, so that's not something that well, you, have to do. you do. You do, and I come. I came up with a way. So there's really like three. You got three ways to manipulate rocks. Okay. okay. First of all, you can hit them really hard, <laughs> like a yeah. big sledgehammer. Mm-hmm. Now I don't know about you. I got maybe like two good hits in me. With a, with a sledgehammer, right. and then, like, I'm out. Like, catch me in uh, Amaranth's ASMR stream. Like, I'm taking a nap, okay? Okay, dude. Nice. After that, you can cut them, right? If you can, you know, get them in a small enough form factor that you could fit them on, like, a saw or something, you mm-hmm. can cut them with diamond blades, okay? Now, I have a tile saw. I can make that work. <laughs> But I need to get them small enough to fit on the tile saw in the first place. Okay. Now, the third option. Now, this option is way more dangerous, but it's really fucking cool. Now, I don't really want to spoil not anything. Using dynamite. I am going to blow some no. rocks up on stream. It is going to be fucking wicked, bro. <laughs> you don't understand? Like, they're going to go everywhere. It's going to be sick. Is that even a I don't know, but we're going to blow up some fucking rocks. It's going to be sick. Okay, I will tell you now, you are under no obligation to make shelves out of rocks, okay? <laughs> I shelves, have to. But, what would no, Ella you, think of me? Ella like, doesn't... <laughs> I think she Dude, meant you can't plastic. say that she doesn't care. I think care. she meant like she rock cares. facade. I don't think she meant like this dude's got to cut rocks like for for it to look like natural. I was thinking, I was literally thinking rocks like the size of a big mango or something that you just put on the ground. Like I was not thinking that you should make shelves out of them. Okay. We well, <laughs> we will uh, we'll see. I'll, you know. I've already done the research. I've already sunk a lot of time into making these rock shelves. I found this like really tiny YouTube channel. This dude makes all kinds of stuff out of only rocks. And I sent him an email, you know, asking him for help. So like, okay. we're going to make something out of rocks. I don't know what it is. Okay. Maybe I'll just put a rock on a shelf, but that'd be, we'll see. That'd be sweet. Okay. So there's that. So the thing that Ellen and I were talking about, we're like, we... Uh, chinchillas here's here's the deal and and you might be uh, this might be a little capital d colon but chinchillas they are pets um it is very like people can get pet chinchillas right but these ones are ambassadors that we want uh to represent their wild counterparts right we want to talk about wild chinchillas we want to talk about wild populations we want to talk about chinchillas um in the fur trade and stuff like that so we don't want it to look like dito's cage you know we don't mm-hmm. we don't want to just like show them off as like our, our pets yeah. at alveus because it, it's a wild animal sanctuary so we we're talking things like this like <laughs> just like that looks a little more like wood <laughs> yeah no i can i can do that i can we can make like real wooden shelves like with the bark on them right. and whatnot. yeah that, that's, that's easy and then this is the thing that ella was talking about is um rock ledges like this but this is like not really you don't have to blow this up this is like plastic <laughs> i know but then movement's gonna eat it and you're gonna have to spend like another like 48 hours just like right. in Actually, disarray of walking around with with movement in your car like what's your uh, what's your profile picture what is this uh you? it's me in a stormtrooper costume yeah so i'm, I'm part of the uh the 501st legion it's like the largest Ooh. Star Wars cosplaying uh, charity group, and they go around to like children's hospitals and stuff. Oh they work God. with Make a Wish a lot. That's sick. It's, what I didn't it's know. Like that. A, 
it's like a worldwide thing. Wow, I love that. Okay, cool. Uh, COVID's kind of shat on it, so I haven't yeah. done much for them, but yeah, but I'm eager to to do that once everything's back to normal. Sweet. All right. Um. Okay. What uh, What else do we have to discuss? Hmm. Shelves. The... Yeah, we talked about the shelves. We talked about Ella's nose flute. Ella's nose um, flute. Your mod team. Oh yeah, the nice guys. <laughs> All well-adjusted adults. I was. I'll be honest, I was surprised. But really? Those are I, all... You got all guys from my team. At, oh, one guy that's not on my team, but they're all great. Yeah, awesome. Um, is it just... It's just the four, right? Yeah. Uh, lock, rip... Um, Dion Oh, space. fuck. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I haven't talked to Dion yet, because he's a, he's a Swede, but I already know what he's like. He's a fourth and viewer. <laughs> you know that because of his profile picture? Yeah. He's wonderful. Okay. Um, the dude has multiple illnesses, like you can just tell. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I think, I mean, that's that's going to be sufficient. We'll, we'll come up with brows. To, he said, yo. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Um, we'll talk about, Ella and I can handle, like, uh, for lack of a better word, decorating the cage. So we'll, we'll put branches mm -hmm. and stuff in there. Um, and then, yeah, I don't really have ideas for other elements right now. Chat, do you have, in terms of enrichment, I mean, we can also, it doesn't have to all be in their cage, you know, we'll take them out for training and enrichment and stuff too, mm -hmm. so I think that'll be sufficient for them to have a bunch of shelves. Um, wait, you have a tile saw, saw cutter? Yes, I do. Could one of the shelves have tile glued on it? Mm-hmm. Yay! Tile or... Granite would be even better because the granite stays way cooler than like nice. any other. He already knows. Rock. Chinchillas, chinchillas like uh, different temperature surfaces is good for enrichment too, and they'll just like splay mm -hmm. out on it. Um, oh, the other thing that chinchillas loves, chinchillas love. Um, you ever seen a chinchilla take a bath? No. Oh. Okay. Here we go. You got to remember, like. Guys, like, I sent her an email saying that I wanted to build her a desk. And oh, within, that's, oh my god, like, I forgot! Within, like, 24 hours, I'm in a Discord call with her and Ella, and the call lasted, like, five minutes, and she was like, fuck a desk, you're gonna make a chinchilla. In <laughs> I don't even know what a chinchilla is, man. Like, what the hell? Um, and so I didn't sleep. I stayed up all night. I was watching chinchilla videos. Oh I didn't god. get things up and taking baths, but... Yeah, he like, sent me an email because he was like, I was inspired by your conversation with Big Dog. I'll make you a new table if you want. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> Do me one better. Make an enclosure. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a chinchilla bath. So this is the other thing that chinchillas absolutely need is they take dust baths. Um, they love dust baths. They'll do it daily if you provide them with dust daily. Um, is it me or is this counterintuitive to bathing? Ba bath and dust. Yeah. I mean, it's not like dirt, like... it's like, I don't know if they have, if it's like anti-mite or something. It's, it's, mm. it's for grooming. It's not okay. dirty. It's, it's nice. Then they're all clean and happy. Um, so. He looks happy. He is happy. I don't know. I mean, it, it obviously it doesn't need to be circular because whatever, but something mm -hmm. where we can do a dust bath. Okay. It can all, honestly, yeah. it doesn't, you don't need to do anything for that. I can also just buy a dust bath. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Because um, we do have to change the dust. So it's not like something that could just be built in there. Because then you have to like scoop mm -hmm. it out. So don't worry about that. But unless you have like a cool idea or something, because you have ideas. You can put it on the cleat and then you just take the whole cleat out and change it, whatever. Oh. True. That'd be sick. <laughs> okay, cool. We can do dust baths. There's, there's like infinite things we could do. Um, you know, obviously I'm going to, I want, I want chat's input on it as I'm going along building it. For sure. Um, it'll be fun. It'll be, it'll be good content. Uh, you know, blow shit up. yeah, we're going to blow shit up. Um, are you all set up like, uh, audio video wise? You have the camera? Oh yeah. So after, after I, uh, got out of that discord call, I was like, okay, I was just going to like kind of stream for, for fun mostly like at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, getting to be a part of this is so cool. I was like, all right, let's let's get some fucking gear. So I got the Hollyland uh, HDMI streamer. I got the Sennheiser G3. Like I'm moving my gaming PC to the shop. Like we, it's gonna be not scuffed. Nice, it's dude. Great. Do you have what mic do you have? Uh, the same one you have, that, that oh, okay. so, wireless Sennheiser. Oh, um, see, I don't even thing. know what I have. You said it, and I didn't even know you were talking about a mic. Yeah, it's, it's fine. I know Locke does all that for you. Hooray! But. That's great. Good. Um, okay, and you're going to stream the whole thing. And tell me, if you have a schedule, tell me your schedule. And if you don't, same thing that I told ACOM. Um, I'll put you on my auto host. And then mm -hmm. uh, if you're live when I'm getting offline, I'll just host you. Okay. Yeah. No, I, like I said, I'm not hundred percent sure on a schedule yet. Yeah. Um, I'm really going to just try to get it, you know, knocked out fairly quickly. The, the thought of not getting it done by April 17th somehow and movement, not having a place to live makes me sad. So <laughs> even if it has to sit in the shop for a while, like we're going to get it done. All right, cool. um, I'm trying to think. I mean, movement, it's not like he's going to be homeless. He has a cage. No. <laughs> Make him like sleep in your nightstand or something. <laughs> okay, but yeah, I get you. It, it would be great if it could be done by then. Uh, April seventeenth is when Ella's moving in with Moomin. So. Okay. Yeah. No. It'll it'll be done by then. Sick. Um, and yeah, it's gonna be fun. I'm excited. Uh, a little nervous, but mostly excited. Uh, yeah. Nice. It'll be cool. All right. And there's I'm tons of content. You know, Miz says that 120 star is infinite content. I'm telling you, the workshop is infinite content. Infinite there is infinite content. things you can do in there. Let's like, go. I've got some Heelys. You know what Heelys are? Yeah, dude. Shoes with the wheels. Mm -hmm. So this is a little out of the budget at the moment, but I'm going to put a jet engine <laughs> on those models. It's going to be sick. That's such a bad idea, bro. It's a great idea. <laughs> That's such a bad idea. Dude, when I was nine i was on heelys in the tennis court with my best friend and she fell on the other side of the tennis court and she broke her ankle and she told her mom that i pushed her what the fuck she was on the other side of the court dude when she fell and i went over there and i was like oh my god are you okay and she was crying she's like maya pushed me over and i was like bitch i did not but she actually broke her wrist so that's did what she got for lying chat don't lie no because i told her mom i didn't push her over and she's like oh yeah she lies a lot and i was like yeah i know hmm. Well, I have fallen a lot on my Heelys, so well, I, I need the jet engine to help, I think. You'll definitely need some knee pads and stuff if you're going to put jet engines on them, because you'll fall yeah. a, a lot. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> I think the confidence is good. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I'll message you. I'll let you know if I have, if I have other ideas. Uh, good luck with your rock research. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to do great on stream. Yeah, um, we'll see how it goes. You're a natural born farmer. Uh, it's like I was telling my friends yesterday. Some of them were watching, I think, which is kind of weird. But uh, yeah. what's up? I was telling them that uh, it's just like farming, uh, farming low W's in Discord. It's just more people. That's exactly right. Yep. So, all right, cool. All right, good shit. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, have fun talking to Ella. Tell her I said hi. Okay, I will. Hi, Ella. I'm gonna tell if her that here. you said she was stupid because she doesn't know what dang. She's not stupid. Dank. <laughs> I'm not going to say, hey, by the way, Mojo said that you're dank. She's going to be like, what? <laughs> she knows. I, she, if I say, she knows. you think so? We'll find out. I'll, yeah, I'll she, she knows. Okay. She's a she's a Minecraft frog. She's she's weirder <laughs> than us. That. I guarantee you. She is. Just, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. All right. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, later. All right, later. Oh my god. That guy's gonna do great on stream. Holy shit. Um, okay, so that's Mojo. So he's working on the, uh, he's working on the chinchilla enclosure. Um, I'm really excited to see, to see how that turns out. Um, he's very serious about it and, and is trying really hard to make something great for us, which I so deeply appreciate and I'm so not used to on, uh, you know, when it comes to woodworking. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't need to say that. I gotta pee. Um, so I'm gonna do that, and then I'll be back, and I'll play the video of the chinchilla. I'll play a chinchilla video, because I feel weird running ads.
Thank you guys so much for your donations, by the way. $1,763.16 is amazing. Um, epic chinchilla bath in 4K. All right, give me a second. Yay! Expert, thank you for the 10. Wait, there's a FaceTime call. It's not being microwaved, no. It's outside of the microwave, it's just a bath. Rodney, thank you for the five. Baby chinchillas are so cute. Okay, um, so there's a couple order of business. Orders of business. I have a business proposition. Christ. What is it? Like, me thinking, actually, that you had, like, a skill set that you wanted to contribute. Thank you. Um, okay. So, I don't think that I want to wait until Ella's done with her class to talk to her about the pollinator garden and everything, because that's pretty much the last thing that we have to talk about, I think. Um, in terms of other sponsors... I did have one sponsor reach out to me, and they wanted to do, uh... Uh, pet t it, it, they do pet TVs, um, and I turn them down because of the potential for mixed messaging. I, like, explain to them the whole pet trade thing and whatever, and they're like, oh, okay, I get it. A what? Pet TVs. Like, some dogs and cats like watching TV, so they make, like, TV channels that animals like, pets like, dogs and cats like, and they play them at vet hospitals in the waiting rooms. I don't know. But I said no uh, for that reason. Um, I had... <sighs> this is 
so hard. My sponsor is telling them that, that the way that the camera set up isn't going to work. And he's just like, he's not like the best texter. And they're trying to figure this out. And like, he's not responding. And I don't know what to tell them because I don't know how to change it to make it more aerodynamic. I don't know what I'm doing these things. Um, the camera is, uh, I don't know, it's so hard. They flipped it sideways and it's still, like, really high off the bird's back. I don't know. Uh, it's stressing me out. Um, is it a specific camera for birds? It's, like, a new model that's not been released yet, um, and... The whole point of the collaboration is for this camera. <laughs> uh, it like stabilizes the horizon. Its specs are like nuts. It's it's uh, less than thirty grams. Um, so, yeah, we, we do we need to figure this out. Uh, okay, so let's talk. Do you guys want to talk pollinator garden or vivarium first? Let's talk vivarium first because Ella linked me something a while ago. And I never watched the video, and I need to, so we can watch it together. Uh, so, just so you guys know, um, the, uh, Ella and I want to do vivariums for all of our reptiles, um, so we're gonna do live plants in all of our enclosures instead of fake plants. And initially, we were thinking of doing a tank with water, but at this point, I think we are considering doing, uh, or I think we are just going to do water dishes instead. But let's just watch this video anyway. Yo, what's up, Serpa Squad? Tanner here, and I'm back with another this Paladarian build. Too. And Serpa this one will set up the new enclosure for Samson, my African bullfrog. Yeah, if you Serpa recall, design. we made his first setup just over a year ago. That one was pretty cool, but I always knew I wanted to do it again in a larger tank. Let's transform a standard 75 gallon aquarium into Samson's forever home. The first thing I want to do is drill the tank for filtration. Prior to drilling, it's good to make sure the glass is in tempered. For that, I'll use a pair of polarized sunglasses and a computer what? screen. His voice sounds I put a laptop loud. in the tank and turn the sunglasses. You'll notice that the picture on the screen blacks out, which indicates that it's not tempered glass. If this doesn't occur, then the glass is tempered no, and can't be drilled. Fast. You're right. It's okay. It's a long video. It's like 14 minutes. After that, I mark the glass for where I want to drill the holes using a diamond-tipped hole saw as a guide. After that, I built up a ring of duct seal putty around the guide. Putty! I also put tape on the inside of the tank to keep the cut glass from potentially falling and breaking the other pieces. Once all of that was in place, I filled the putty reservoir with water and drilled with a diamond tipped hole saw from earlier. In doing so, I'm not applying any pressure, I'm simply allowing the weight of the drill to do the work for me. Once the holes were made, I wet down some 150 grit sandpaper and buffed the edges of the glass. Hooray! I wiped everything off with a microfiber cloth. Wow. These holes were made to accommodate two three-quarter inch threaded bulkheads. Oh, that's sick actually. Now on to the background. For this one, I'll use a crevice background and faux rocks from Universal Rocks. Full disclosure, I got these for free, but I don't receive any compensation for talking about them. Anyway, before use, I sprayed them down to remove any debris from the manufacturing process. This wasn't I necessary, but I figured it would make for less cleanup later on once the tank enclosure. is set up. I went with this because the background is really thin and will allow me to maximize the footprint of the setup. The overall look also resembles something called. like what you had seen in Samson's natural products, habitat. So I First I put the background portion in the tank to get a feel for how it will look. Ooh. 
you think of it, the three dollars? It looks good, but we need to drill through it to accommodate for one of the bulkheads. I don't know why. For that, I drilled through the back of the stupid. bulkhead with a small bit to align the hole. Then I went back with the diamond tip tool saw and made an appropriately sized hole. With the hole drilled, I attached a low profile strainer. Now we can attach the background to the tank. For that, I'm using GE Silicone 1. I started by applying silicone to the left side of the background only. Looks like tacky. From there, I put a board and several PVC pipes up against the background. These held everything in place while the silicone cured. It may seem a bit excessive, but this will help keep the background as close to the glass as possible, and thus maximizing the footprint of the tank. Hooray! After allowing it to sit for 24 hours, I removed all of the pipes. As I said earlier, this build will include these faux stones. They're completely hollow, which means they can easily be modified to create a land area like the previous paludarium. Before doing that, I placed the stones to get a sense of the scape. Here's what I ended up with. It's pretty simple, but should function well. What I did next was draw a line on the stone. I cut along this line with a drywall saw. Now the stone can fit flush with the back of the tank. After that, I marked the top of the stone. I cut along this line to create the barrier for the land area. This will work perfectly because the stone is waterproof already. I'll just have to affix it to the tank. I pressed the rock up against the background and marked a few areas that need cut. I removed these sections so the rock barrier can be attached directly to the glass. Otherwise, it would have been much harder to seal. Before doing that, I marked the back of the tank so I know where to attach the rock. From there, I applied silicone to the bottom of the rock and the back of the tank. Yum. It was pressed in place. An additional bead of silicone was applied along all of the edges on the outside and inside of the structure. I smoothed them out with my finger. Yum. Like usual, it was left to cure for 24 hours so it was secure for the next steps. After that, I rolled the background back into place. The other stones were put in place as well. It looks really sharp, but I need to make sure the land area is waterproof. I filled it up, and it worked perfectly. Hooray! During this step of the build, I realized I should have included more bulkheads to the back of the tank to make maintenance easier. One for draining the water feature, and one for draining the land area. For that, I'm using two half-inch threaded bulkheads. I repeated the process from earlier to drill through the back of the tank. I put one near the filter's output, and one in the land area. Once they were attached, I put the background in place once more. Now I'll hook up the hardware for the filter's return. For that I have a 45 degree barbed hose connector, a filter hose, hose clamps, and the return piece for the filter. To start I screwed in the hose connector. I attached a hose and secured it with a hose clamp. After that I measured the height of the intake strainer to determine where the return should go. I wanted a few inches higher than the strainer. I marked for this on the right side of the background and drilled a hole. Then I put the filter's return on the other end of the hose and secured it with a hose clamp. It was inserted through the hole in the background. I cut the hose a little shorter for better flow. The remainder of the background was silicone to the sides of the tank like before and let to sit overnight to cure. Now I'll use scrap segments of the background, silicone, and pigments from Universal Rocks to blend all of the pieces together. I siliconed a few pieces over the cracks and filled in the excess with silicone. Styro, thank you for the 20. I went back with a brush and applied pigments until I got a look that matches the rest of the background. At first, the colors don't look totally the same, but they blend better once the silicone cures. I did this process on both sides of the land area. Wow. After that, I siliconed the accent stones to the bottom of the tank. Once everything cured overnight, I ended up with a really Whoa. cohesive look. With all of that taken care of, it's time to address the plumbing and filtration aspects of the build. I went with a Whale 500 canister filter that I got from my friends at CJ. I also received this for free, but just like the background, I don't receive compensation for talking about it. This filter is probably a little oversized for 30 gallons of water. However, I went with something stronger because the tank is 4 feet off the ground, and I need to account for the loss in pressure. I'll also be using two threaded 45 degree barbed hose connectors, two slip 45 degree barbed I'm hose connectors, close. hose clamps, various filter hoses, barbed inline switch valves, OD fusion cement, and seal tape. I started by cementing two slip connectors to the drain bulkheads. Then I wrapped the threaded hose connectors with seal tape. These were screwed into the other bulkheads. A short length of filter hose was attached to each of the drain connectors. A switch valve was added to each hose and secured with clamps. I also decided to connect the two together with a barbed T insert so there's technically only one drain tube. Oh. Hoses were attached to the appropriate connectors and secured with clamps. Lastly, these were connected to the canister filter. Ooh. With all of the hardware in place, I can finally do a water test. I know the tank will hold water, but I want to ensure all of the plumbing pieces will as well. 
Sometimes they're not tight enough and will leak. Luckily everything was in order and it held water perfectly. Oh, that looks so cool. Now we can finish off the land area. I'll treat this just like I did the previous paludarium. I'm going to use a piece of metallomat as the false bottom and a sheet of geotextile fabric as the barrier. I wrapped the metallomat with the fabric and pressed it down into the land area. I'll also be using the same substrate mix as before which consists of cocoa fiber, sphagnum moss, and orchid bark. I filled in the land area with this mixture. Let's move on to the hardscape. To maximize the space for Samson, I'm keeping it simple with a few small pieces of Malaysian driftwood and a single large piece that's covered in java moss. I started by placing the moss covered that's a piece. Nice piece. I like how it looked but I knew it would fit better if I split it into multiple pieces. After being split in two, it fit into the scape much better than before. Then I added the smaller pieces. Wow. Now let's bring the scape to life with the plants. I'm using most of the same plants as before including curly ficus pumula, bird's nest fern, golden pothos, and syngonium podophyllum. For the planting substrate I mixed up some seachem fluorite and fluval stratum with the fluorite as the primary substrate. I'll also use geotextile fabric and zip ties for this portion of the build. I cut out squares of fabric and filled them with a small amount of substrate. Then I wrapped the roots of the plants in the fabric and lightly zip tied it shut. The excess fabric was snipped off. What oh. I've created is a nice starter pot for the plant. Oh. I did this for most of the plants and placed them throughout the setup. Huh. I utilized crevices to keep them situated. Over time the roots will grow through the fabric and anchor onto other surfaces. The only plant I didn't do this for was the pothos. Um, it was planted along the edges of the land area. The three. That seemed to work out perfectly in the previous setup. So I, I also try to plant to everything in areas no, where Samson right. likely won't ruin them. It may seem a little sparse, but they'll grow in over time. I'll, I'll look into it after we watch this. Now then, let's add substrate to cover the bottom of the tank. Like For that I'm using brown sand. This should match well with the background and create a cohesive aesthetic. I used a hose to more evenly distribute it throughout the setup. Once it was evened out, I filled up the rest of the tank. There are just a few more details to add including leaf litter and springtails. I sprinkled leaves on the land area and throughout the water feature. Yeah, They'll tie everything together, tie. make for a more natural looking Ooh. setup, and help jumpstart the springtail colony. Oh my god, it looks so natural. They were added next, and as you probably know, cool they'll help clean that? up after Samson. The last thing I need to address in this video are the lids. For that I'll make screens using the method I've shown previously. It consists of screen frames, screen corners, spline, and fiberglass screen. To construct this, you simply cut out the frames and attach them together with the corners. Then you use a spline roller to attach the screen to the frame with the spline. Oh my gosh. The excess can be removed and it should fit right into the aquarium's frame if you measured correctly. I I'm not capable. And there you have it, okay. the new and improved African Bullfrog so Paladarium. I think it's an improvement from the previous setup and there. will function better for Samson, especially since it's twice the size. We're not going to add him in this video though. I want to let the plants root in and become established for a few weeks prior. Don't worry, I'll show that in a future video. In the meantime, I'll let it do its thing. I'll likely tweak things a little bit, and I also need to add a cleanup crew and the water feature. I'll talk about that next time though. I've been working on this for a few weeks now, and I really like how it turned out. I'm curious to know what you think though. Let me know down in the comments. It's so nice. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Anyway, that's all I have for you in this one. Until next time, Surfer Squad, take care and peace. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's so good. I want to see one for, I want to see a vivarium for uh, snakes. Um, let me just like search. Snake. Naturalistic king snake enclosure. 180 gallon vivarium. Scorpion vivarium. Mm -hmm. Should we watch this one? Hey everyone, welcome back to another vivarium build. Without any delay, let's get right into making the new 180 gallon vivarium. As I typically do, we'll start out this build with the false bottom. If you recall, this enclosure previously housed my king snake Houdini, so Houdini. I already had an egg crate false bottom made. However, I needed to make some modifications so that this false bottom would be suitable for the new vivarium. That said, I removed the planters and filled in the holes with more egg crate attached with zip ties. 
You'll notice that the egg crate is already covered you... in a layer of carbon fiberglass window screen mesh. Why did you cut As it many of you know, this is my preferred ducking. barrier in most cases. Originally, I used this barrier to keep mulch from falling what? down into the main falls bottom area, so I used a relatively coarse mesh because it was cheaper Easy, at the time. That being said, this mesh is just too coarse for the substrate that we will use in just a moment. So I covered the egg crate in an additional layer, but this time with weed control fabric. This isn't the same thing as weed blocker, which I've advised in the past is not the best solution. Unlike weed blocker, this allows water to readily pass through it while also retaining the substrate. You might be wondering why I used this instead of a finer mesh. Well, I wanted to try something new, and I believe this could be a better option than mesh moving forward. Oh, Anyways, I cut out a piece of the barrier and covered the existing mesh. Then I zip tied along the top corner, leaving some excess on the sides. With the false bottom completed, it was then placed into the enclosure. From there, I proceeded to put the Cocoa Husk liner backgrounds into their respective locations. If you recall, these are the same backgrounds from the previous build. They are essentially just a sheet of insulation foam with a few protrusions of expanding foam covered in Cocoa Husk liner. Mm -hmm. These could work as a decent background in their current state, but they don't have enough definition for my liking. So I got a really large piece of cork bark and propped it up in a good location Sick. using some bags of substrate. With the cork bark in place, a few additional elements were incorporated, including planters and accent cork bark pieces. To I attach the planters, the I simply wedged them in place or stuck again? them onto the background with a thumb. He's at 1.5 now. The cork accents, on the other hand, were stuck onto the background with a nail. Next, I got some great stuff pond foam Maybe. and applied it to the background. My goal here was to add a lot of definition to the background and create a canopy area of sorts using the cork pond. bark. This will become even more apparent as we progress through the build. After applying all of the pond foam, I let it cure for around 8 hours or so. Then I removed the bags of substrate, Ooh. thumbtacks, and nails, and carved out the foam with a razor scraper. Doing this step correctly is pretty important. By carving out the foam, you not only get a better aesthetic, but you also expose the spongy interior of the foam itself. Whenever we add the silicone in just a moment, it will more readily stick to the spongy surface than the glossy, smooth surface of the newly cured foam. It. Now it looks like mud! With the foam completely carved out, we'll move on to the next step, which is applying the 100% silicone. To do so, I like to caulk a generous amount of silicone in globs, and then disperse it with the paintbrush. I find that this is easier and makes less mess. Next, I got a few handfuls of bark, and threw them at the silicone. Normally, you could get away with simply dropping it in place, but since I'm building this vivarium in the upright position, I don't have much of a choice otherwise. The same thing was also done with some cocoa fiber. However, as I added the cocoa fiber, I pressed it into the silicone with my hands. This is really important for the longevity of your background, wow. because otherwise the cocoa fiber is prone to fall out of the silicone over time. That's so cool. These same procedures were then repeated oh for gosh. the entire background. I should also mention that you can We're use cocoa fiber alone for this streams. process, but using bark creates more texture not... and a better climbing surface for arboreal or animals the, such as geckos. Um, giant acrylic enclosure. After the main part of the background was complete, it was time to add some additional hardscape elements, in this case manzanita wood. Using a board, I propped up the branch on the background. I also snipped off a few branches to create a better aesthetic. Then I repeated the same process for another branch on the right side. With these branches secured, some accent branches were then stuck directly into the foam. This works really well for small branches, but I don't recommend it for larger elements. Next, I got a can of Great Stuff Gaps and Cracks Expanding Foam and applied it over top of the Manzanita so one. I ran out of pond foam and didn't want to buy more, so I used this foam instead. Oh. It works just as well, but unless you use black silicone, you may end up seeing the yellow foam through the silicone and cocoa fiber layer. Anyways, after the foam cured for a good 8 hours or so, I removed the support boards and carved it out like before using a razor scraper. After getting it all carved out, I covered the foam in silicone, bark, and cocoa fiber just like before. Now we'll make some jungle vines. You may have seen one in the previous clips and wondered what it was. Hobbyists have been making DIY jungle vines for years using various methods. I wanted to keep it simple using materials that I already had. So I got three different thicknesses of cotton rope. On that, if you're going to take the time and money to make jungle vines, be sure to get different thicknesses. Doing so will allow you to create a much more natural look, which is probably why you're making the vines in the first place. Anyways, creating the vines is quite simple. All that you have to do is get a length of rope, coat it in silicone, and then knead it into some cocoa fiber. With a thicker rope like this, it's a little more challenging because you can't do the entire rope in one go. Even the next thickness down is much easier because you can roll the rope into a ball to apply the silicone. Either way, just make sure you do your best to squeeze the cocoa fiber onto the rope. After you're done making the vines, be sure to let them sit out for at least 24 hours so that the silicone can cure. Vines. With the vines cured and ready to go, let's put them into the vivarium. In doing so, I wanted oh, to twine so as many cool. together as possible, much like you'd see in nature. I also wanted the vines to look like they had competed against a tree and won the battle. What I mean is that in nature, vines are competitive. They will climb up and over trees and oftentimes kill them. 
Since the branches are from a dead tree, this will help create the aesthetic that I'm going for. You'll notice that I'm using super glue to attach these vines together and onto various surfaces. Before you get all up in arms about it, cyanoacrylate super glue is totally safe to use for applications like this if you allow for the proper dry time. In fact, it's often used in aquarium applications. I really wanted these vines to look like they were stuck to everything, and super glue allowed me to pull that off quite well. Now it's finally time to mix up the substrate. I do this all by sight and feel because I've mixed it up so many times, but if you want to get more information on it, be sure to follow the link. To start, I'm using about one part of cocoa fiber. Then I added roughly two parts of sphagnum moss. It looks Next like, I added uh, one part of bark, and roughly one half part of lumpwood charcoal. Chicken. Finally, I topped it off with the substrate for my 8 year old vivarium. I did this because that substrate is extremely well established. Although I did have to add additional substrate to that vivarium over the years, the oldest portion of it is around 8 years old. There are also old roots, leaves, and other organic components that will serve as a quick food source for our microfauna. All things considered, a good substrate will serve as the foundation to your vivarium. If you want your plants to grow well and your microfauna to thrive, the substrate comes first. Now let's put the initial layer of substrate, substrate into the vivarium. Comes first. There's about 20 gallons of substrate here and in the end, I used all 20 gallons. That said, I like to add it as I go rather than all at once. As I've explained in previous videos, I also recommend sloping the substrate up toward the back of the vivarium, meaning that it's much thinner in the foreground than it is in the background. This will create a greater sense of depth and allow you to provide an adequate amount of substrate for those large background plants. Mm -hmm. From there, it was time to pin the ficus pumula onto the background. At first glance, this might seem like a total waste of time because the majority of ficus leaves died off later on. That's not a big deal though because the stems and roots are still completely intact. Although I think ficus pumula is an easy plant and it's portrayed that way by others, it can be quite temperamental. In short, this plant hates change. Whether that be a change in temperature, a change in humidity, or something else, there will be some amount of acclimation die-off guaranteed. The severity of this of course is dictated by the amount of change. So for those of you who have commented about having issues with this plant, give it time. Just because the leaves died off doesn't mean that the plant is dead. Once it becomes accustomed to its new environment, it will come back stronger and more dense than ever. The main thing that you want to avoid is having the stems dry out or melt back. In this instance, I had issues keeping the heat at the correct level. I accidentally left Houdini's heat lamp in the light compartment, and it was getting upwards of 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just way too hot and much different than what the plants were used to. Panic. So a lot of the plants, and the ficus included, were actually melting back because they were literally being cooked by the light. It took me a day to realize what was going on, and once I removed the light, everything has been good since. Also, I'm keeping the humidity in this setup between 95 and 99%, Jeez. which is much higher than it was before. Anyways, most of the plants that experienced acclimation issues have since bounced back and are showing off some new growth. That being said, it's a real shame that the ficus didn't stay as it was, but as time progresses it will quickly grow to look as it did before. After I got the ficus in place, I then gave the vivarium a decent spray down to start getting the humidity up to speed. Next we can plant and set up the rest of the vivarium. Rather than run off all the plants names as I typically would, I'll put their names up at the end of the video, so stay tuned for that if you're curious. You may have wondered why I didn't put much on the left side of the setup. Well, I wanted to give ample room for my larger plants to grow, and this was the perfect spot. So I began putting the majority of my background plants in the left corner. During this part, and the entire build for that matter, I like to move the plants around until I get the placement just right, so you'll see me doing a lot of that throughout the build. As I've said many times before when choosing your plants, be sure to choose a good variety. More specifically, plants that have different looking and different sized leaves. This will help you achieve textural contrast, which in turn will allow you to make a natural aesthetic quite easily. Of course, the placement of the plants is very important as well when trying to pull this off. That said, obviously you want to keep most of your larger plants in the background, and the smaller ones in the foreground. However, I do recommend placing some tall plants in the foreground and vice versa. This will break up the landscape and in fact is a natural aesthetic. In nature, plants don't distribute themselves neatly by height as you often see in people's setups. In line with that, I try to place the plants in a way that keeps you interested. Each plant acts as a focal point that draws your eye throughout the setup. Essentially, you want to create visual tension. There are countless ways to make tension in your composition, but in this instance, I'm mostly using the variation He's of plants to do so. Regardless, there is tension in nature, and that's exactly what I try to do when creating my naturalistic landscapes. Enough on that though, I just wanted to give you additional insight on how I set up my enclosures. You'll notice that I periodically spray the plants throughout the build. This is really important when building a large vivarium like this, because there's relatively no humidity yet. Doing so will keep your plants hydrated, and help you get a jump start on the humidity. How, does, how are those staying on? Thank you for the 10! I appreciate it. Wow, they're so cute. Look at them. Since I have the majority of the vivarium hardscaped with the background, I mainly need to add accent hardscape elements. So throughout the build, various twigs and other natural elements were placed among the plants. If you have the chance to, I recommend creating levels in the substrate with your hardscape elements. For example, I'm using this piece of cork bark to make the substrate higher in the background than it is in the foreground. Using the cork makes it look a little more interesting than simply sloping the substrate as I described earlier. 
At a certain point, I decided that it was time to start placing the leaf litter. I don't really like the look of leaf litter unless it's placed in a way that looks natural. That said, I like to place it we as I'm planting the enclosure branches. so that I can make it look like the plants are going up from underneath uh. it. However, you'll notice that I planted a lot of carpeting plants. Long term, I want them to cover up a greater portion of the leaf litter. Where does... Does he just... I mean, you can't just pick up leaves. You've gotta, like... I wonder what his process is for getting his leaf litter. For the last bit of planting, I'm adding some bromeliads and air plants. Do you remember that super glue from earlier? Well, super gluing these types of plants in desirable locations works really well. The super glue won't damage the plants at all, and it will allow you to anchor the plants before they do so naturally with their roots. Damn. Lastly, I added some of the microfauna, including springtails and dwarf purple isopods. Whee. I'm just starting out with these ones for now, but as we move forward, I'll add various other species. Oh, it's like a little enclosure for them. <laughs> Massive enclosure for them. Holy shit. Gosh, that's crazy. Mine's not gonna look like this, just so you know. Yeah, I guess this isn't a snake enclosure. I don't know why it came up when I searched snake. Cause he doesn't put a snake in here. He just go. he just starts listing the plants. We covered a lot of ground in this video, but the vivarium is far from complete. A lot of the plants really have to grow in, and many of them also have to bounce back from the issues I had in the beginning. Unfortunately, some of the plants died off completely, so they will need to be replaced as well. I also want to add a lot more plants, including more bromeliads and air plants, to name a few. There's quite a bit that I still have to do on my end before I even want to think about stalking this. I will do a follow-up video in about a month or so, and we can discuss more about stalking at that time. However, I did drop various hints throughout the video as to what I'm going to keep in this, so hopefully you were paying attention. Finally, I'll leave you with a few takeaways. Understand that you're not going to have 100% success. It could be something as simple as acclimation die-off from your plants, or a few plants just don't work at all. Don't get discouraged though, be patient with it. 9 out of 10 times the plants will actually come back given enough time, assuming that they were actually suitable for the vivarium to begin with. I've had plants show up years later after I thought they were long gone, so it definitely does happen. Also, as you're setting up your vivarium, take your time. I built this one over about a 2 week span of time, and I'm still not complete. I want to make the thing as perfect as possible so that way I can enjoy it for a really long time. What is? In the past I used to jump into builds and really just rush through them. No. The previous 125 gallon of I want to see the... This is a hey everyone and welcome back. In this video I will show you how I set up this custom built 190 gallon plywood reptile enclosure it. Anyways, let's get right into the setup. This enclosure is going to have live plants that need watered every once in a while. That said, I have to make accommodations to remove any excess water Snake. with these. So I got a 3 quarter inch drill bit and drilled a hole right through the bottom of the enclosure. Vacuum. Then I got myself a 3 quarter inch bulkhead and put it in place. Next I got a ball valve and attached it to a 3 quarter inch tube. The other end of this tube was then attached to the bulkhead. This will allow me to simply turn a lever to remove any excess water when necessary. Ah. After getting all of these pieces put together, I wanted to ensure it that it would hold though? water. So I filled up the enclosure slightly and determined that it would do the job. I also rinsed off the sides of the enclosure to remove any debris that I may have missed earlier. Next, it was time to make the background. In this case, I wanted to make a background that could be easily removed when necessary. In other words, I didn't want to have to silicone it in place like most other backgrounds. That said, for the main pieces of the background, I used some insulation foam. I made measurements beforehand that will accommodate for the thickness of another piece of foam, as well as the thickness of some cocoa husk liner. That said, I used these measurements and cut three pieces of foam to the appropriate size. Next, I got some planters, and made some marks to roughly indicate where I wanted them placed on the background. I then used a utility blade to cut holes similar to the sizes of the ones I marked. These didn't have to be perfect, just large enough to allow the planter to be at an angle. With the planters in place, I then sketched some formations around them. These will act as a guide in just a moment. Then, using a screwdriver, I poked holes all throughout the sketched formations. Afterward, I flipped the foam over, and covered the holes with some paper. Then, I proceeded to tape the planters in place with some masking tape, and sketch some more formations on the foam. Like before, these formations were also poked full of holes. Why? Next, I got some great stuff gaps and cracks foam, and used the sketches to spray down some formations. The foam will seep into those holes that I poked earlier, and in effect hold onto the insulation foam much tighter than if they weren't there. 
I kept spraying the foam until I came up with some formations that I really liked. The way that he's doing this background is probably far more cost effective than me trying to buy that like textured stuff that we saw in the first video. So I should probably do this. Then I repeated the same process on the other piece of insulation. I should mention that these two pieces will eventually be used on the sides of the enclosure. Next, I got the largest piece of insulation foam. Using a utility blade, I scored the entire surface and also poked it full of holes with a screwdriver. Why is then I rolled out some cocoa fiber liner and cut it to the appropriate size. With the liner cut accordingly, I then covered the scored side of the foam with some 100% silicone and put the cocoa fiber liner in place. I went around and did the best I could to spread out the silicone underneath of the liner. Also, like before, those scores and holes will create additional surfaces for the silicone to adhere to. Then I cut off the excess liner and scored the back of the foam like before. Finally, I put down some more silicone and used a combination oh, of weights really? and clamps to hold the liner firmly in place while the silicone cured. That's a lot of clamps he's got. Eesh. At this point, the expanding foam on the side panels was fully cured. So afterward, I used a scraper to shape the formations. I should also mention that I placed that piece of paper earlier so that the expanding foam didn't seep out through the back. Then I rolled out the cocoa fiber liner and cut a piece the size. Afterward, I scored the back of the foam like before. However, I didn't score the front of this piece because the great stuff foam itself is pretty porous. So a lot of the silicone will get down in there and perform a similar function as, say, the scores. Mm -hmm. Again, I got some silicone and caulked it all over the front of the foam. Silicone! He then I attached silicone. the cocoa fiber liner much like before. However, it was more difficult this time around because of how uneven the surface is. So with a combination of some weights, clamps, and finagling, I finally got the liner firmly in place. That looks annoying. Then I let the silicone cure for a few hours and remove the clamps and weights. Next I trimmed off the excess liner. Using silicone and clamps, I then attached the excess liner to the back of the foam. Afterward I repeated the same process on the other piece of foam. This is gonna be a bitch. <laughs> Next it was time to create a false bottom using some egg crate. I've covered how to do this in other videos, but in short, I'm using some zip ties to attach several pieces of egg crate together. I made all of my measurements ahead of time, so all of these pieces are being cut accordingly. I should mention that this false bottom differs from what I typically do, because it's the exact size of the enclosure itself. That said, the purpose of this false bottom is to keep the plants in place, as well as keep any excess water separate from the substrate. This will all make more sense later on. Anyways, after making the egg crate structure, I set it's it into 22. the enclosure to ensure that it was the correct size. Yay! Ooh, sad Now we will mix up some substrate for the plants. I started out with some organic potting soil, then some cocoa fiber, a little sphagnum moss, some perlite, and finally some sand. All of these components were then mixed thoroughly together. The goal with this mixture was to create a substrate that will retain moisture without becoming soggy, similar to an ABG mix if you will, but not exactly the same. Next up, it was time to clean off the plants. I should mention that I was experimenting with a lot of these plants. I would like for all of them to work, but I honestly expect some of them to fail. Anyways, I started out with this peace lily. Initially, my goal was to remove any existing substrate and trim down the roots. I thoroughly rinsed off the plant to remove any excess dirt or fertilizers. That said, I'm shooting water straight out of the hose, and peace lilies are pretty sensitive to chlorinated water, so I anticipated some die-off from doing this, and it did occur later on, but it was pretty minimal. After getting the lily thoroughly cleaned, I planted it in a new pot with some of the substrate we mixed up just a bit ago. Hooray! Next, I got this large Boston fern and trimmed off a few sections. I really doubt that this plant will actually work, but I wanted to give it a try because I was able to get it for free. I also think it would look pretty cool in this enclosure, so I repeated the same process that was performed on the peace lily. I removed all of the excess dirt and thoroughly rinsed it off. I know that there were no fertilizers used on this plant, but I still want to get it as clean as possible. Then I planted each of these ferns in their own planter using the same substrate as before. Next I got this calathea and cleaned it off just like the other plants. Finally, I repeated the same exact process on this philodendron. You may have noticed that each plant was given an exterior planter. That said, I'll explain more about it later on. Anyways, after getting all of the plants cleaned off, I put the false bottom into the enclosure, and then the background. As you can see, the background fits tightly into place without any silicone, and that's exactly what I planned for. I wanted to make this entire setup Whoa. in a way that could be easily manipulated that down the road. Cool. With these elements in place, I then grabbed one of those huge cork rounds from the unboxing video, along with some of the plants and tried to come up with an arrangement. I should mention that I did sanitize this cork prior to using it. I simply rinsed it in warm water and scrubbed it very thoroughly. Normally I would bake or boil something like this, but it's just so large that I wasn't able to do so. After playing around with this layout a bit, I determined that the cork round was just too large as is, so I took it outside and cut a decent section of it off. Afterward, I continued to arrange the elements until eventually I came up with a layout that I liked. 
Then I grabbed a sharpie and traced the outline of the planters onto the egg crate. Using some wire cutters I cut along the lines until the planters could fit in place. The idea here is that the false bottom will firmly hold the planters in position. Although he doesn't do it very frequently, Dean is a burrowing snake. That said, when he's digging through the substrate I didn't want him to be able to uproot the plants. As I stated earlier, each plant has an exterior planter. This is important because one will be attached into the egg crate false bottom, while the other can be removed at any time. Stop! After getting all of the appropriate holes cut, I removed everything from the enclosure. Then I rolled out some carbon fiberglass window screen and attached it to the egg crate using some zip ties. To do so, I started by zip tying a single side in place. Then I placed all of the exterior planters into their respective locations and continued to zip tie the remainder of the mesh. Pretty. After getting the mesh completely secured, I drilled 8 holes into each planter. Using these holes, I zip tied the planters into the egg crate. And that completed all of the work necessary for the false bottom, which was then placed into the enclosure. Next, the backgrounds were placed back into the enclosure. Once again, you can see that they fit snugly into place without the use of silicone. This could easily be done with a single background, you don't need three of them. After getting the backgrounds in place, I dropped all of the plants into their exterior planters. Yay! Then I poured in some reptile bark. As you can see, the nice thing about keeping the plants separate is that nothing is mixed together. As I explained earlier, Houdini is a burrowing snake, and he would have easily uprooted the plants in a typical planted enclosure. Also, by this point, you've already realized that I'm not making this a bioactive enclosure. There are numerous reasons why I set this up the way that I did, and I'll explain it all in the final video for this build. Anyways, once I had a nice layer of bark, I proceeded to add a ficus pumula that I grew myself to one of the planters on the background. We will do more with this later on, but in the meantime I got the cork bark and put it in place. Next, I grabbed the sticks that were in Dean's old enclosure and found a nice spot to put them. Although king snakes aren't arboreal, Dean likes to climb on these sticks pretty frequently, so I wanted to incorporate them in this enclosure as well. I got two arboreal Then I put the phylodendrons into the background. Oh no. Afterward, I pinned the ficus pumula to the side of the background. In time, I hope that this covers the entire background on its own, but we'll see what happens. Anyways, from here the plants could finally be watered. To do so, I simply pour some water into the base of each plant. So watering this enclosure is pretty easy, and no spraying is necessary. However, I do typically spray Dean's enclosure when it's time for him to shed. This raises the humidity, which allows his skin to come off in one piece, as opposed to a bunch of fragments. Finally, we can put the water bowl in place. I'm using this water bowl because it's easy to clean, and I feel that it doesn't take away from the overall aesthetic that I'm trying to pull off. With all of the pieces put together, let's get Dean and set him free in his new home. Yay! Oh, he's, that's a pretty king snake. Holy cow. It was really cool to see him explore, and I think this is a perfect example to illustrate how inquisitive snakes can be. However, I quickly realized that there was a slight problem with the setup. I had anticipated this early on, but I wanted to see if it would actually occur. If you remember, the planters were left open. This became an issue because Dean systematically went through all of the planters and dug up the dirt. Like in the case of this piece no. of- No! Dean! So to stop this from occurring, I simply wrapped some of the window screen mesh onto the planters using rubber bands. I went through the entire enclosure and did this on every single plant. I'm more than confident that this is enough to keep him out of the dirt. And in fact, I've seen him try to do it several times and he hasn't had any luck. <laughs> Saved. <laughs> I also quickly determined that the Boston fern just wasn't going to work in the setup for a number of reasons. So I got some blue star fern to replace them. I actually think these look better anyway, so I'm not disappointed at all. While adding the blue star ferns, I also added a few miscellaneous pieces of bark just to add more definition to the overall landscape. Another thing that I should mention is the left corner of the enclosure. Right now it's kind of barren and the design seemingly doesn't make sense, but eventually the calathea will grow pretty tall and fill in that space. So in that regard, I'm not fully content with this design as is, but in time it should fill in quite nicely. And again, if any of these plants don't work, or I determine that I want something else, they can easily be swapped out because of the way that I did the planters. Additionally, I may add more plants later on, but that's a topic for a different time. Next, we will briefly go over the lighting for this enclosure. For the plants, I'm using a standard 48 inch LED shock light. It puts out 3000 lumens at 4000 kelvin using only 30 watts. As of now, I'm very pleased with how this light is working for me. I also put in a Reptile UVB100 by Exoterra. This is effective up to 15 inches, so I placed it just above the cork ground to create a basking area. And believe me, Dean is definitely utilizing this new basking area, spending about 3 quarters of the day there. For ventilation, I simply have this 180mm fan hooked up to a timer. It runs for a half hour every 2 hours. This keeps the air moving, as well as drawing new air from the holes in the back. As of now, this is working quite well, but I may modify it down the road. In an enclosure like this where there's minimal air ducts, it's important to have something that keeps the air moving. So in this case, I'm simply using the fan. This feature then leads into the temperature. I don't keep a heating mat on this enclosure, nor do I use anything to heat the enclosure other than the lights themselves. That said, the temperature varies from location to location. For example, the basking spot is around 84 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. 
However, locations such as the lower right or inside of the cork round are around 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the temperature at night drops to around 74 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit, variation give or take. All this variation is a good thing. If Dean gets too hot, he can go somewhere that's colder, or vice versa. I should also mention that since this is a plywood tank, it retains heat much better than a glass enclosure, for example. So in that regard, it works in my favor. The humidity, on the other hand, is fairly consistent. It's roughly 75% throughout the entire enclosure, give or take. Whenever the fan runs, the humidity will drop slightly since the air is circulating, but this is totally fine. And that about sums it up. Currently, I'm really liking this setup. It has some growing in to do, and I'm sure it will change things in time. My goal with this setup was to make it natural looking, while also keeping it very functional. There are a lot of challenges that come with keeping snakes in a naturalistic enclosure, and especially burrowing snakes. That said, I did my best to make the setup as practical as possible, and I'll discuss more about it later on in another video. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please drop me a thumbs up below, as it helps support what I'm doing on this channel. As always, I thank you for watching, and I have a lot more naturalistic enclosure builds on the horizon, so stay tuned, and I'll see you. Nice. What's up, surface? Um... Okay. One of the good things about this is that we do have a... I, I told people if they're interested in sponsoring projects for Alveas, um, that they can email me. My at alveasanctuary.org with, like, uh, you know, what they're interested in and, and a budget. And I did have a guy email me who loves reptiles, and his budget is 3 to 5k uh, Canadian, uh, which is, like, 2 to 4k USD. Um, and so I had a call with him and Ella... The day that we went and picked up Stompy, is in the car on the way there, and I asked him if he would be down, because he can't sponsor an enclosure, because we already have the, the acrylic, and we're getting a terrarium donated for the bullfrog, so I was like, you can't do an enclosure, but you can do, like, a bunch of parts of the reptile, if you want to donate a chunk, and we can just, like, use that for the reptile room, and I'll, I'll put his name somewhere, um, then, uh, we... Yeah, and, and he said he's down for that. So we'll have we'll have a pretty decent budget, hopefully, to, to make this work. I do want to contact this guy. Oh, he has an Instagram. He just has an Instagram link. No, a, a TikTok link, but that's it. Texas Avian and... Hang on. Hey, okay, um, expert, thank you for the $20, uh, la 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 la, the vet called just to check on Stompy, it was super nice, um, 
Okay, I just followed this guy on Instagram, and I will message him on Instagram. Um, and hopefully he sees it, because I don't see another, uh, I don't see another way to contact him besides Instagram and TikTok. We'll see. Okay, um, this is stressing me out about, about, sorry, I'm, I'm stressed out about the corridor collaboration, because... My sponsor is like really worried about the size of the camera and the profile, and it's not like they can use a different camera. Expert, thank you for the $20. Um, like he wants something flatter and it's like, they can't just flatten the camera, you know what I mean? Can you make the mount smaller? It's not even the mount. The mount is so short. It's like, I would show you, but it's an unreleased camera and I don't think that I should do that. Cause, all right, he's calling me. Hang on, sorry. Thank you. I, that one came through a bit ago, but um, give me a second. Yo, what's going on, Surfer Squad? Tanner here. I got a really special one for you today. As most of you know, I've been into the hobbies that I portray on this channel since roughly around the age of six. Over the lifetime of my hobby, I've made countless enclosures, and many of those you've seen on this channel. From frogs to fish and just about everything in between, I probably dabbled in it at one point or another. And over the 22 plus years that I've been doing these things, this hobby's been an absolute blessing in my life, and I can't see it any other way. From the beginning, aquariums have always captivated me. Growing up, we had a few, but success was never great. I always wanted one, though, because of an epic tank at the pediatrician's office. Some of my earliest memories are of that tank. I vividly remember a beautiful planted tank full of java ferns and inhabited by Bozmani rainbowfish and clown loaches. The truth is, I actually liked going there simply to watch the fish. And to this day, I'm just as easily captivated by this hobby. Sit me down in front of just about any tank and I'll be content. I honestly believe that having an aquarium or something of the sort is one of the most enriching hobbies possible for people of all ages. That's why I continually go to great lengths to explain what I'm doing in these videos. I know it's not always the most popular format, but I don't want there to be any question about how I build these things. I also try my best not to perpetuate the stigma that this is an expensive and unattainable hobby. Sure, you can spend a lot of money on this stuff, and in some cases I have, but the majority of things I've shown on this channel are budget conscious and easily repeatable with the right information. While in this hobby, I've crossed paths with and befriended a number of interesting characters. To name a few, there's Jay Wilson, Cannon Harkin, Rachel O'Leary, Ed Ballou, Greg Whitstock, and Weston Zimmerman. I want to focus on Weston, who's a certified Aquascape contractor that I met through Greg. Last summer, Aquascape and Tussie Landscaping helped me build a pond in my front yard, which is where the journey begins. It turns out that Weston and I are kindred spirits. We both enjoy water features, build our own PCs, enjoy cinematography, and get this, we both love moss. Needless to say, we've kept in touch to this day, and I consider him to be a good friend. A few years back, he had the opportunity to explore the Amazon River and tributaries in Colombia. While there, he saw cardinal tetras and other fish in their natural environment. This experience captivated him so much that he wanted to bring the river home in the form of an aquarium. Despite the fact that he builds ponds for a living, he didn't know much about aquariums when we met. This is where I come in. It didn't take long for him to tell me about the things I just described and his dream to one day have an Amazon-inspired aquarium of his own. Without hesitation, I told him we would make it happen. That was about 16 months ago. Eventually the window opened, and in late July we made it happen. To my excitement, he got a 150 gallon aquarium from a local fish store. Although bigger tanks are more expensive, this is a great option for a new hobbyist. It's a lot easier to have consistent conditions in a larger setup, which means a greater chance of success. One of the first things I did was drill the tank for bulkheads. He wanted a clean look with minimal equipment showing. No doubt this is the way to go. I also blacked out the sides with window tint film. This will be an in-wall tank, so doing this will hide off the plumbing components. Before I showed up, Weston cut a hole in the wall and built a stand out of 2x4s. We set the tank on this stand after the previous steps. I installed the bulkheads and went on to scape the tank. As with other tanks that include a lot of hardscape, I first put down pieces of egg crate light diffuser. The scape will consist of 200 plus pounds of hardscape alone, and this will evenly distribute that weight. Before adding those items, I'll add the planting substrates. Per usual, I used a mix of Seachem Fluorite Dark and Fluval Stratum. I rinsed them off and added it to the tank. 
I'll cap this off with red flint sand, which has a larger grain and nice coloration. It will also complement the hardscape, which consists of tan elephant skin stone and weathered driftwood. While scaping, I wanted to make a composition that could be viewed from the front and the back. I wanted to fill the tank while also leaving room for plants and fish. All the spaces will create a lot of territories for the fish once it's planted. I foamed everything in place with black expanding foam and covered it with sand to secure the hardscape. I didn't want the pieces to float away. This will also make the skate more rigid, which makes maintenance easier. Here's what I ended up with. Let's add the plants. We got a great assortment of awesome plants from Dustin's fish tanks. I chose primarily low light plants, so this is easy to care for and because it will be dimly lit once the plants grow in. I arranged the plants in a way that I thought would best serve the fish and to create good coverage. After all of that, I could finally fill the tank. I also added various botanicals to naturalize and finish the look. That meant we could finally add the first round of fish. I should mention that prior to this, we dosed the tank with bacteria, but I forgot to film it. Anyway, we initially stocked it with five bristlenose plecos, nine of mono shrimp, and a few handfuls of various nerite snails. That was back in July and the last time I saw the tank in person. Since then, I know the plants melted back from acclimation, the fish have grown, and Weston added a new group of fish in September, 12 Peruvian Ultima Angel fish. I hadn't seen much of this in person, and I wasn't maintaining the tank. I didn't know what to expect almost six months later for my return visit. Here's how it looks as of early December. I was ecstatic to see how much it has grown in and how it looks now. It's very close to how I imagined it should when I set it up. Also, all of the fish I added at least doubled in size. My favorite part of the tank is how the lilies and Valisneria cover the top. It creates awesome coverage that shades the tank. It looks incredible from a low angle as well. Although the tank looks great, I will tidy things up a bit. I also brought more plants, 14 cardinal tetras, and 6 peppered corydoras. I let the fish float acclimate while I trimmed the plants and added the new ones. Before I show more on the tank's progress, I wanted to show you how Weston set up the stand. He framed in the front with some reclaimed barnwood, which looks incredible. He used the same barnwood on the opposite side and covered the other areas with reclaimed tin. I think it creates a really unique look. The canopy flips up and gives you access to the top. He has a single Current USA Serene Sun LE Pro LED light over the top of the tank and we use polycarbonate greenhouse panels for lids. Under the tank we have two Whale 500 canister filters that were provided by our friends at CJ. There's also an Oase Oxymax 400 air pump for aeration. Another cool feature is a retractable black curtain on the back, which gives you the option to cover the back of the tank. This allows you to appreciate the main viewing side even more. This was a challenging build because of how it's installed on the wall. I had to place an item and check it from the front to see if the placement was good and repeat. I like the end result though. My goal was to create a biotope-inspired aquarium. Weston wanted something that resembles the underwater landscapes he saw in Colombia. Let me clarify though, this is not a true biotope setup. Most, if not all the plants aren't found in the Amazon. Neither are the hardscape items. However, it's all set up to resemble what you'd see in nature. It's dimly lit, there's botanicals with mom buildup, the water is tinted with tannins, and it's planted somewhat sparsely. Again, this resembles what you'd see in an aquatic environment. This is in contrast to our typical aquascape. Sure, they look nice and are inspired by nature, but they are far from being representative of it. When it came to fish selection though, we tried to keep it as close as possible. Excluding the snails and shrimp, everything can be found in South America. I also tried to keep the setup beginner friendly based on what I've learned over the years. The plants are low tech, and the fish selection overall is fairly easy to care for. The botanicals and leaf litter break down and fertilize the plants alongside the fish waste. That means no fertilizer is necessary. They also add the necessary acidity and make the desired tint in the water. In other words, everything works in harmony with very little intervention. Based on what Weston's told me, this has been incredibly easy to maintain with virtually no issues at all. Keep in mind that he's had no experience with aquariums before this. The cool thing about this build is that it brings everything full circle. Weston helped make my dream of having a beautiful pond a reality and I helped fulfill his dream of having an aquarium. It's fun to set up tanks for myself, but I find even more fulfillment in this. Now he and his family spend quality time together watching the aquarium and are generally enriched by having it in their lives. Being able to extend my experience onto others so they too can be blessed by this hobby is incredible. Again, that's why I put so much care into these videos. And think of this, much like the aquarium that inspired me as a child, the setup and viewing of this tank will likely be some of the earliest memories of Weston's kids. Apparently his son is always retelling about the time I stopped by to install the tank. How cool is that? Nature has a real ability to bring people together. That's only possible a few months out of the year in areas like where I live. Having an aquarium or similar setup allows us to enjoy nature year-round. I continue to make friends through this hobby and hope to make many more. Although I only know a few of you personally, it's crazy to think that there's nearly 750,000 like-minded people out there. If you're still on the fence with trying these hobbies, I highly recommend diving in. Make a knowledgeable friend that can jumpstart your hobby, watch some videos, read into it, etc. There's so much more I could say, but I think you get the idea. 
I really hope you all enjoyed this one. I know I had a fun time doing it, and it's great to be able to give somebody else my art for a change as opposed to keeping it all for myself. I'd like to do more builds for other people in the future, and I actually have another one planned for the not so distant future. A friend of mine has a certain desert dwelling species that a lot of you have been requesting a build on for years. I don't want to keep on myself, but he has one, so we'll do that really soon. I don't know when, but definitely kind of soon. Anyway, do what you can to help support the video. Give me a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, maybe share it. I don't know. Do whatever you can, help support the video. Until next time, Surfer Squad, take care and peace. Yo, what's up, Surface Squad? Tanner here, and in this one, I'll set up another low-tech aquascape. I'm using a 14.2 gallon SR Aquaristic Grinless Aquarium for this scape. This tank will go on the rack I built a few months back that holds a 16 gallon scape. Anyway, let's get to work. Typically, I save this for the end of the project, but I started by putting the SD decal on the front of the tank. There are a few other things I did prior to scaping it. First, I turned the tank on its side and taped off the edges. I'm using Rust-Oleum Ultra Cover Black Latex Paint to cover the back of the tank. A small nap ruler was used to apply five coats, allowing the paint to dry between each application. After allowing it to dry, I removed the tape. I turned the tank upside down to incorporate a self-leveling mat. This is just a 1 quarter inch thick neoprene with an adhesive backing. I unrolled a pre-cut piece and carefully stuck it to the bottom of the tank. This will mitigate any potential issues caused by inconsistencies in the stand, allowing the tank to sit as evenly as possible. The tank was then turned to its upright position. Now it's ready to be scaped. To scape this setup, I'm using exclusively Hakai Stone I bought months ago at Aquashella. I've been saving these for an Iwagumi or Stone-only aquascape since that time. It's a beautiful and sought-after stone with a subtle aquamarine hue. Unfortunately, I don't have many to work with, so I have to use Egg Crate Light Diffuser and Insulation Foam for additional height. My vision is to set this up as an islandscape of sorts. I want a few isolated hardscape formations with a clean and simple layout elsewhere. This will make sense as we go through the build. Anyway, I tried several stone arrangements before I made something I like. Initially, I wanted three islands, but I couldn't get it to look right with this selection of stones. What I ended up with were two islands and a path between. This layout probably doesn't make sense now, but with a few adjustments, it will look much better. For that, I'll utilize a few materials including polyester fluff and moisture wicking fabric. I used the nylon batting to fill cracks between the stones. This will act as a barrier for the substrate, keeping it separate from the rest of the setup. It will also create additional landmass to compensate for the lack of stones. For substrate, I'm using a repurposed mix from an aquarium I just dismantled. It's a combination of fluval stratum, sea chem fluorite, gravel, and sand. I filled in all the spaces behind the stones to create a good foundation for plants. Once I had the base layers down, I topped everything off with a fresh layer of fluval stratum. I did this for a more cohesive look and for more nutrients since the repurposed stuff has some age to it. With the substrates in place, I concealed the nylon with pieces of the moisture wicking fabric. This will be a perfect growing surface for moss and it will hide off the nylon. As I placed the pieces of fabric, I sprayed them with water so they lay in the cracks better. Here's what I ended up with. This should give you a much better idea of how the scape will look. I covered the fabric with a layer of chaffa moss and suswasser tongue that I chopped up into small pieces. This mixture was attached to the fabric with cyanoacrylate superglue gel. This is safe to use with livestock once it's dry and will anchor the moss in place before it attaches to the fabric on its own. A little bit of glue goes a long way. I put dabs throughout and covered them with a moss mixture. After placing everything, I gave the tank a good spray to keep the moss hydrated. For the remainder of the plants, I have a good variety including Bulbitis Hudolotai, Cryptocorn Wenti Bronze, Echinodorus Tenilus, Ludwigia Repens Rubin, Micromeria Brownae, Pogostemens Dolores Octopus, Rotala Nongenshan, Rotala Indica, and Valisneria Americana. I typically like to plant these setups when they're full of water and from the background to the foreground. However, I'm planting this one dry to keep things cleaner. I started in the foreground with the crypts. These will be a nice pop of texture and color when the tank fills in. The chainswords are planted throughout the foreground as well. They won't grow much taller than they are now and will be a perfect foreground plant. The Bobitis was planted atop the highest structure in the tank. Although this is near the back of the tank, it will act as a mid-ground element. From there I added stems of Rotala Indica on both islands as a background plant. I have to make another call to my sponsor now. Um, I'm very stressed out, I'm sorry, it might be a bit. And then I have to call them back and tell them um, what's up. So I'm just going to keep clicking through his videos, because I don't want to get offline quite yet, but I do have to handle this because everyone is very stressed out, including myself, so... Sorry, I'll be muted for a bit. During the entire planting process, I periodically sprayed the tank to keep the plants hydrated. After that, I planted the Pogostemon and Ludwigia on the large island as background plants. Next was the Creeping Charlie. I filled in the remainder of this island with stems of Rotala non-Genson. Lastly, I planted off the Jungle Vow on the left island. 
Everything looked to be in order, and I filled the tank with water. I did this to ensure I liked how off the plants looked, and to remove any floating debris. It looked good, so I drained the water and put it on the stand. Answer. With the tank in place, I added the remainder of the substrate, which is carob sea, whiten, and light sand. It was poured throughout the tank and distributed with a brush. Now let's get this thing filled with water. I used Fritz ACCR water conditioner, which was provided by our channel sponsor, to dechlorinate the water. I slowly filled the tank so nothing was disrupted. While the tank filled, I set up an AquaClear 20 with pre-cycled biological media. I added some Fritz Time Turbo Start 700, which was also provided by our channel sponsor. Along with the filter media, this will jumpstart the cycle of the tank so we can immediately add livestock. For those of you wondering, I'm lighting this tank with a Nike Crew Classic LED. Now then, let's add the fish. I've had my eye on these for some time now. They were at my local fish store for months and no one was buying them. I finally decided to get them myself. These are Volcano the Rasbora. I think they're a beautiful fish and something different from what you typically see. What? I also added four olive nerite snails, two horn nerite snails, what? and four mono shrimp. I should also mention that all of these critters went through quarantine prior to being added to the scape. It's never happened. I'm so stressed. You guys wanna hear? Okay, so what's going on right now is the camera. Um, oh shit, Clark. Cool. And there you have it, the Hakai Stone Islandscape. I think it turned out really well, showcasing the fish and stones perfectly. Um, Something different than what I've shown on the channel thus far. Sorry, here, I know you're watching it. I think it's a welcome addition to the animal room though. As I said earlier, my vision was to create an islandscape of sorts with densely planted islands and a lot of open space. I can't wait to see how it looks as all of the plants become well established. What do you think though? Do you like how the scape turned out and what do you think about the fish? I likely add more in time, but these are what I had at the moment and who I made the scape for. Anyway, I really like how it turned out and I can't wait to see its progression. As always, I really hope you enjoyed yeah, this one and learned something months. new. Until next time, Surplus Squad, take care and peace. Okay. Um, so basically what's happening right now is uh is the camera that they have in terms of weight is a-okay it's less than 30 grams but the size of it is questionable because it's shaped like the lens is on one side so originally they had it upright and then they tried to put it on its side and aerodynamically the best way is it for it to be sideways facing the wing because, you know, it'll like streamline that way, the way that our transmitters are shaped, you know, like long. But they can't do that. And my sponsor doesn't know if he's comfortable putting it on his birds. Especially at a stoop. So I need to talk to my sponsor. Um, get a 3D printed harness. We did. It is. That's not what matters. It's the camera that is the problem. And so my sponsor is like linking different cameras and he's like this might work this might work. and it's like no it's not the point of the collaboration is the camera you know it, it's like it, it's just really it's frustrating it's stressing me out um and now he's not picking up and, and i'm worried that he went to sleep um already because it went straight to voicemail so So I don't know, um, I'm hoping, I mean, I'm hoping that he can be okay with it. And if he's not, then I'm hoping that he could be okay with me doing it with Ori because Ori is not stooping yet. Stooping is like going straight up and then coming straight down, right? Um, and I think that's the maneuver that he's most worried about. Uh, so... He knows that Ori isn't doing that, and so maybe he'd be comfortable with me doing it with Ori, but his bird will stoop. So... First of all, I'm hoping that he... That he, uh... That he's okay with it. Second, I'm hoping that he's okay with me doing it. And if neither of those things work, then I have to set them up with somebody else, and they have to cancel their travel. 
which I really don't want to make them do because they already canceled. They already had to cancel once because of the Corona stuff. I just wish we connected sooner about about the size and shape of the camera. I, I didn't realize that it would be so touchy, um, but he knows more than I do. So my sponsor knows more than I do. So. So I don't know. I'm feeling anxious. And guilty. Or not guilty. I just, I feel bad. Anyway. Um, okay, let's let's move on with uh with the rest of this podcast until he calls me back. I'm gonna have to mute then. Um and take his call. That's on them. They should have... No, I mean, I, I just don't think they realized either how, how touchy it was going to be. Like, I, I said the, the weight of the camera should be fine. If they can make a rig that goes on the backpack, great. Like, it should work. So I, I, their impression was like, okay, if it can clip on the backpack, it'll be fine. You know, and, and Jeremy's uh, far more picky than I, than I realized, I guess, about, uh, about the shape of it. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, the only other thing that I was going to talk about for this podcast is uh, our pollinator garden. So, do, 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 do. Um, we want to do a pollinator garden because it's really important important um, to teach people about. Um, it's going to be cool to have native plants there, and I also would love to have bees there. Except I tried to reach out to Texas Bee Works a bunch of times. Not a bunch, like several times. Um, and never heard back. So I don't know that I'm going to be able to reach her to do a collaboration, but uh, I still would like to get bees on the property. Um, and then eventually I'd like to raise monarchs on the property, uh, much more for educational purposes than like conservation um, reasons. But I think that that could be really cool. And I would really like to be part of, a, of tagging monarchs um, as a project for, for Monarch Nation, who we had on the... Um, we had a employee of Monarch Nation on the podcast. So I would really like to do that. Um, Ella has drawn up some designs for the pollinator garden, but they're not at all final yet. Uh, we'll just have some planter boxes and um, a trellis and, and stuff like that. So, and a lot of milkweed and some wildflowers and stuff. So it'll be really cool. Um, potentially putting up some insect boxes or insect houses there as well but i'm not completely set on that yet because there's some disease linked to those so i need to do more research for that and yeah so that's the other update that i had for you guys um what else is there to talk about So many little projects, lots of little projects. I think that's it. I think I went through everything. Um, yay, milkweed, true. We do have a quiz. Because it's a podcast and why not? So let me go ahead and start loading that up. Do you guys have any questions? What? Yes. Surprise. There's no steak in it. Like, don't, don't panic. <clears throat> I'm not getting any right answers. That's fine. There are stakes. Honestly, they're kind of hard questions. I'm not going to lie. But it's fine. It's just for fun. Expert, thank you again for the donation. I appreciate it. You donated $95 19 minutes ago, too. I appreciate it. Questions. Import questions. Whoa. Cool. 
Risk, thank you for the three months. Okay. Five, confirm. Save quiz. Gosh, I'm so stressed now. That like completely killed this vibe. <laughs> okay. Um, it is a good song. Okay, are you guys ready? I'll this. Select. No. Well, get ready. Because it's starting. The first question is how old is Stompy? Seven weeks. No. Fifteen weeks. No. Is she 17 days, 18 days, 20 days, or 14 days? Writing the answer in chat does nothing for you, sorry. You have to click on the actual quiz. If you followed the Insta, you would know. True, go follow the Insta, it's Alvea Sanctuary. The correct answer is 18 days. I think. Fourteen. Sixteen, seventeen. She was born on Valentine's Day. She was 17 days. I said 17. I lied. Scam. Scam quiz. She was 16 on Wednesday. She was born on Valentine's Day. Oh, shoot. How tall is the enclosure for the macaws and the other two parrots? Is it 6 feet, 20 feet, 15 feet, or 10 feet? Expert, thank you for the $17. Dan knows this. <laughs> True. The correct answer is 15 feet. Nice. I'm waiting, uh, samples have been shipped for my merch, so I'm waiting on those before I can, um, before I can start. All right, this next question, is how does Mojo usually spend his Saturday nights? Is it uh, paying me $50 for, to mod for him, cosplaying, blowing stuff up, or watching Amaranth ASMR? Chuck, okay, I don't feel bad at all for the question that I messed up at the beginning. Because, <laughs> like, I don't know how you're so sick to know the answer to this. Um... The correct answer is watching Amaranth ASMR. But it probably should be all of the above. Uh, Two hundred and forty nine people got that correct. What the heck? Okay. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, the next one is. When does the chinchilla move in? Moomin. When does Moomin move in? Tomorrow on Easter, April 17th, or on Groundhog Day? Easy. Jot gave up. No. Pinch, think of the two months. The correct answer. Rex, what's up? Oh, I've also asked Rexer if he would be willing to make a song for Alveus, and he said he's down. Because the intro music that I use is not good. The first song is okay, but then it gets really sad, and I just have to replay it over and over. Um, Rexer made... Rexer, can you... Or can someone link me the song that he made? The XQC one that everybody likes. The, the correct answer is April. Huh? 
It is April 17th. What the hell? Next question is, what emote is going on the nutrition room sign? <laughs> is Alveus looking for an animator? We currently have an animator, but you're welcome to send me a resume if you'd like. Um, at uh, my at alveussanctuary.org. Oh my gosh, no, Bernardo, I wasn't. This is the last question. Question number five. The first question, uh, yeah, sorry. Fat King got a positive score. That's, that's actually sick. Two hundred and ninety-nine people got that correct. Well done. Final results. Zach, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know. Good job. Okay, Zach is a sub. Um, Zach, what do you want? You know the drill. What a shit score to win with. Okay, well, E Rob. All right, here we go. Damn it, he's live. Dude, I wonder how many cats can go around the house. That cat house is sick. So it's an oh lord, it's an exclamation point. <laughs> Zach CS underscore, right? Hey, Miz. <laughs> Zach CS underscore. Yo, I said to you, my man. <laughs> What's up, okay, man? Okay, dude. Okay, dude. Okay. That's a fat fucking ass. Okay, That's Captain. All right, one more clip, and then we're done. <laughs> All right, chat, what do you... Okay. Okay. Um, I find it funny you call Matt Miz. I pretty much never do. Uh, okay. So... That is the end of the podcast, I think. Not that it was really a podcast. Um, yeah, I'll grab Stompy for you. Sniffy, thank you. But I have to make sure that Ari can't see her. She's okay. <laughs> Among the worst 48 hours of my life. But she's okay. Oh, peep peep. Peep peep. Peep. She's camera shy. Look at the little dinosaur, man. It's crazy. She's so cool. She looks bigger? You think so? I gotta wear. I'll wear her tonight. 
but last she, last I checked, she was 575 grams. Um, Orion is 500 and like 20 grams, so she's she weighs more than Orion already, and she's 18 days old. <laughs> Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm gonna hang out with her tonight. Cause you're alive! Okay. That's it, folks. That's it for this business meeting. Can I get a motion to adjourn the business portion of the meeting? No. Space, what? The no, ma'am, fancy. Motioned? Okay, I got one motion. Can I get a second to that motion? Okay. I'm gonna host cheese. I'm rating cheese. Um, guys, thank you so much for for the donations today. Um, Two thousand dollars is insane for just like sitting here chatting. Oh, it did it. Oh, um, sitting here chatting and uh, it being such a low key fundraiser. I really, really appreciate those donations. Um, no, lock. I had to, I I've just been turning it off and back on again to fix it. So I just did that and it turned on without me like deactivating and reactivating. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much. Um, I will see you guys on Sunday for a cooking stream that is also uh, a simple mobile stream. So I'm doing that cooking stream on Sunday, the one that I was gonna do, but then you know the whole thing happened with the ring. So it starts at 12 p.m. CT, and the sponsored portion starts at 1. Uh, but I will be making um, impossible ground beef, um, and then uh, da, 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 and then that like cinnamon roll apple thing. So I hope those were some good updates for you. I appreciate you guys caring and watching. Um, I'm just like, honestly, I, I'm gonna go to sleep. I'm gonna try to figure out this corridor stuff. I'm gonna hang out with Stompy and then I'm gonna go to sleep because I'm still really tired, <laughs> but I appreciate you guys a lot. So thank you. I'll see you on Sunday. Um, you know what? Actually, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow for a flight stream with Orion. So see you then in the afternoon, probably like three o'clock or something, two o'clock. Yeah. All right. Peace. See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>